G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here, and before the video begins, I would like to give Audible another big shout out for sponsoring this video. So, if you're unaware of what Audible actually is, it's basically a huge online library of audiobooks that is really unmatched in size and selection. They offer originals, broadcasters, news, comedy, audiobooks, and so, so much more. And Audible have been really generous in providing me with a link for you guys to sign up with and receive a pretty sweet deal. Audible are actually offering all of you guys a free audiobook, two free Audible originals, and a 30-day free trial. I actually signed up myself recently, and another title that I found and would recommend is World War Z by Max Brooks. It's a fantastic novel on the first-hand accounts of the survivors of a global zombie-like pathogen. It really is a captivating story, and I loved how it was paced by breaking up chapters into almost like mini-stories for each survivor's story. I'm also still listening through the last title in the Passage trilogy by Justin Cronin, as my free audiobook for the month. I'm about halfway through now, and I actually took it with me on a trip not long ago, and I was so engrossed in the story that I completely lost track of time, and it felt like the trip was just over in minutes, which was so good because otherwise I would have been bored out of my mind. Oh, and uh, another thing I personally loved about the Audible membership too is that at the beginning of every month, you can choose any audiobook as your free audiobook, and any titles you choose, you actually own them. Which is really great because you can go back and re-listen any time, even if you cancel your membership. And the cool thing is that your free audiobook for the month can actually be of any value, even if it's of higher value than the membership price, which is about 15 bucks a month, and means that you can save a ton of money. It also means that you have literally nothing to lose and everything to gain by signing up. You can also listen anywhere, anytime, on any device, enjoy easy audiobook exchanges, and even roll over credits. So, all you have to do to start listening and capitalize on this excellent offer, guys, is go to audible.com forward slash bbuster or text bbuster to 500 500 to get a free audiobook, two free Audible originals, and a 30 day free trial. That's audible.com forward slash b e b u s t a or text B-E-B-U-S-T-A to 500-500 to get a free audiobook, two free Audible originals, and a 30-day free trial. I hope you guys take up Audible's generous offer, and without further ado, let's begin. Last Thanksgiving, I was driving home from college with my friend, both 21 and female at the time. I live in a very isolated part of Arkansas that requires driving through an hour of hairpin turns in the mountains. There are lots of blind spots and the whole time you're driving on the edge of just huge drop-offs with no barriers. I'm usually pretty confident driving through the mountains, but we were in my friend's car so I was going slower than usual, driving about 5 over the speed limit. So, almost as soon as we started the roughest part of the drive, another car was tailgating us pretty close. This was stressing me out, and as soon as I saw somewhere that I could pull over, I did. I pulled into a church parking lot, and my friend offered to drive the rest of the way, but I declined as it was completely dark and she had never driven this route before. We got back on our way though, and a few minutes later, I have to come to a screeching halt as there's a car stopped in the middle of the road. It wasn't on the shoulder at all, but just stopped dead in the middle of the road. My friend is saying that they must have broken down, but can't call a tow because there's no service in this area. I, on the other hand, immediately have a bad feeling and lock the doors. I tell my friend to stay in the car no matter what, as she's starting to get scared at this point and points out that she thinks it was the car that was following us. I can't tell, but I'm pretty scared at this point. It's parked right before a hairpin turn too, so I can't pass it. My friend starts frantically telling me to go ahead and pass it, but I don't want to get hit by a Mack truck or fall off the mountain or something. So I honk my horn. Nothing happens. No chance of calling for help as there's no cell service like I said. So we just wait there for a while, doing nothing. My friend is crying and freaking out, but I'm too scared to try and pass them. I honk a couple of times and eventually a guy gets out of the car, comes around back and 
leans against his car, just staring at us. My friend is freaking out even more, and I'm just frozen. I tell her not to make eye contact. I'm ready to floor it if he does something, but he just stands there, staring. Mind you, he's not checking his car or anything either. I try to stay calm and just pray that another car will come along soon. This goes on for what seems like forever, but was probably 15 plus minutes. He's just casually leaning against his car, just looking at us. Eventually, we see car lights in our rear view, and then the guy jogs to his door and gets back in his car. He speeds off, going dangerously fast, so there was obviously nothing wrong with his car. I start driving, not wanting to cause a wreck. We don't see anything else for a while, but we pass the same car parked along the highway a while later, and it pulls back on and starts tailing us again. I try to speed up and get rid of him, but he just keeps following us. We have cell service at this point, but I don't know if we should call the cops because, well, nothing really happens. I call home and I tell my brothers what's going on and tell them to wait on the porch for us. And the car follows me all the way home, down the really long drive to my house as well. I get to my house and my two brothers are waiting on the porch holding their deer rifles. I pull in and the car just goes to the end of the drive, loops around and speeds off back the way it came. We tried to catch its plates, but we just couldn't make them out in the dark like that. Needless to say, me and my friend were really freaked out, but when I told other friends the whole story, they just didn't think it was a big deal. What do you guys think happened that night? This happened a few years ago when I was maybe 15 or 16. I used to not have blinds or curtains on my windows and I never bothered to get something to cover them up for a long time. My street is fairly rural and we know all of our neighbours fairly well so I was never really worried about something weird happening. That is, until this night. It was sometime in the winter. I've always been a bit of a night owl so I was up late on my computer I had the light in my room on, but it was pitch black outside, so I couldn't see anything at the window. It was completely silent in my house when I heard it. Three loud bangs on my window. It scared me so bad that I fell off my bed and I stayed down there for a while. Eventually, I convinced myself that it must have been some kind of an animal, like a bat or something, that just flew into my window. I calmed myself down and I went back to or whatever the hell I was doing, and I didn't really think much of it after that. I just uh, never bothered to mention it to anyone, until a few nights later around the same time. I had my window cracked open, still with no blinds covering it, when I heard leaves crunching outside like somebody was walking on them. They stopped right outside of my window, but it was still too dark for me to see what was out there. At this point, I probably should have screamed for my parents or called the police or something, because I could just feel someone just staring directly at me and I could feel that they had bad intentions. I was too scared to even move, but I just knew somehow that there was someone out there. So I did the only thing that I could think of at the time. I stared directly into the pitch blackness outside of the window, put on the most intimidating face that I could manage and stayed like that. I must have sat in that position for a good five minutes until I heard the footsteps again, this time leading away from my window. I shut the window and tacked a blanket around it after I couldn't hear the footsteps anymore, and I barely slept that night. The next day I bought a pair of blinds and told my mum about the incidents when we were at the store. I said to her that I heard footsteps outside my window last night. My mum doesn't get scared or intimidated easily, as she's one of the most fearless people I know in fact, but as soon as those words left my mouth, she just turned white. She said, did you tell your dad about that? And I told her no, I hadn't told my dad and asked why she wanted to know. But she looked me straight in the eyes and told me just one of the most bone chilling things that I've ever heard. Honey, your dad was talking to our neighbour this morning. She told him that she had seen a man walking around our yard for the past few nights. 
and last night she saw him walking towards your window but he disappeared into the dark before she could figure out if it was one of us or not. She said after a few minutes that he left apparently but he came back a few hours later and she saw him while getting ready for work. She knew then that it wasn't one of us this time since the sun was coming up and he also had a knife in his hand. She went outside and screamed for him to leave but instead of running down the street... He ran into our backyard and then into the woods. I live in a military neighborhood and all of my neighbors are active duty, which tends to make me feel pretty safe if something were to happen, but after I just heard that there was a creepy man outside my window in the woods more than once and that he ran into our backyard instead of down the street, I don't think any amount of military would make me feel safe after that. My parents never let me stay over at my boyfriend's house back then, but after that night, she let me stay at my boyfriend's house for almost a week. And when I got back home, my blinds were installed and there was a curtain over the window and, and the window lock that was previously broken was now fixed. I haven't unlocked or opened that window since this happened and we never saw or heard about this guy again. My neighbor never saw anything again and we just reported the incident, but never heard anything about it after that. I don't know who he was or what he looked like, but I sure hope that he doesn't come back. I live on an island where most people live near the coast, but my childhood house was deep in the mountains. Imagine a house in the woods, but at the very top of a mountain if you can. The house is surrounded by thick mist every night, like in the bad horror movies, and the woods around it start less than two feet from the outer walls of the house. Our closest neighbor is a 15 minute drive away, and five minutes away there's also an abandoned house. I think the house belonged to a, a distant relative or something, but was abandoned more than 40 years ago. There's no street lights, and there's all kinds of animals roaming the area. Now, this is important to the story because even though you couldn't see a group of 10 people hiding like one meter away from you in the woods, you could hear absolutely everything right up to a couple of kilometers away in fact. If we saw car lights or heard a car approaching, me and my family would turn off the lights and we would hide. I don't know why, we were just shy and antisocial, you name it. But anyway, I think that's enough to set the story up. I'll add some details along the way that may be important. But my house is small and impoverished, and our family car was a good one. I don't really know much about cars, but my dad always said that without a really good car, we wouldn't be able to go up and down the mountain that we lived in. Also, there's currently eight people inside of our house around 11pm. So, I'm at the dining table just enjoying some cereal while I'm watching some anime. Basically, just kind of having the time of my life. The lights to the house were on, so nothing could be seen in the dark outside. There's a window in front of me that gives sight to the front of the entrance of the house and onto the road. And just then, something calls my attention, but I don't hear or see anything. I think that I see a human silhouette outside, but it doesn't move, so I just ignore it as some effect of the lights in the house and my own reflection or something. More anime, more cereal, and... I feel something move at the other side of the window, and this time, the silhouette is waving at me. I felt my heart jump out of my chest, and I froze. The person outside waves at me as if trying to make sure that nobody else in the house is noticing him. After maybe 10 seconds, in which I'm just looking at him with a spoon halfway to my mouth, he decides to say hello. He then says, I need help. My parents hear this and they approach the window, which made me sure that I wasn't just looking at a ghost, which was amazing news for me. But the man outside starts telling a story about how he got his car stolen at gunpoint and needs help. But my parents are surprised that nobody heard his footsteps or a car or anything, so they whisper their theories amongst themselves. But for this mysterious guy's story to be true, he had to be mugged more than a mile away get his car stolen, and then walk for half an hour in the dark through the woods, following the dim light of our house? It may sound crazy, but my parents decided to actually believe him and they offer calling the police. But our visitor begs and says the stupidest thing that he could have. He says 
don't call the police. I don't have a gun. My parents stay silent for a while. The guy outside knows that he's messed up, but proceeds to make his request. He asks, can I get a ride downtown? My dad nervously chuckles and gives him some sort of an excuse. He mentions the time, the fact that he felt the guy was lying and that he had already called the police, which was a lie in fact. And this is when my favorite part of the story begins. I stand up from the table, shaking. I go to a closet and even though I can't see the guy's face, I know that he's following my actions. I get two machetes that are half my size and run to another room. I was terrified and looking back I probably took away the only weapons my parents could have used to protect themselves in case of an altercation. But I opened the door to my room where me and my siblings sleep and they were watching some silly show, probably something stupid like Hannah Montana or My Carly, and their hyena laughter came out. My sisters are really loud and my younger brothers are 4 years old, 7 years old and 9 years old, so their laughs are angelical by day and demonic by night. But I signal at them to shut the hell up and they do so, joining me and my parents in our fear. We sit there in silence as the guy says, It's okay, if you can't help me I'll just go to the next house, alright? My dad says, There is no next house, you should wait for the police here. I don't need the police, I'm good. This goes back and forth. The guy is now in good shape apparently to walk an hour down the mountain to reach downtown. My dad offers a rusty metal tricycle from our porch so that he can go downtown as a bit of a joke. And the guy accepts this offer and grabs the tricycle. I assume that he just wanted to leave with something. But this tricycle is like 20 years old and it definitely doesn't work now. We hear the screeching of the tricycle for a couple of seconds as the stranger just struggled to be able to ride it, and then it stopped not too far away from our house. At least, it seemed like he stopped, and we didn't hear any footsteps that indicated the guy had left. And after trying to identify if he was still on sight to no avail, my dad finally calls the police. We wait in silence, looking at the road from the front windows. Fifteen minutes later, the police get there, which was an amazing time back home, heroic even, and as soon as the red and blue lights show up, they illuminate the entire road up to the abandoned house. The tricycle is still on the road not too far away, the police claim not seeing anybody on the road, there's only one road into the mountain and if the guy kept on walking they definitely would have seen him. So they take a look in the woods with a flashlight and after that they just called it a day. The cops were clearly freaked out by the eerie look of the house though and they didn't stay for more than five minutes. Luckily, nothing else happened that night and I slept with two machetes under my pillow which I remember angered one of my sisters. But to this day, we have no idea who the person was, but there were no carjackings reported the next day and even though a lot of weird things happened around my house, we never saw this guy again. It's pretty obvious he was trying to steal our family's car but... And there were a few things that we could just never understand. Like, where the hell did he come from? Where the hell did he go as well? If his story was true, he had the worst luck in the world, I suppose. I think the situation was interesting, though, because I often think about his point of view and how Horror Night turns a bit, well, comical. I mean, imagine this. You go to rob a house, it turns out the people inside speak calmly... I don't know how much criminals encounter this as they try to intimidate or deceive. There's a scrawny, seemingly mute kid that tries to be sneaky and grabbing some machetes and then hide in the darkness in the house. And then there's child's laughter coming from non-visible rooms from the house. He could see the doors, but the inside of the rooms would be geometrically impossible to look into from the windows. And in the end, I think that we were lucky to kind of out-creep the creep that night. Because... I just don't see any other reason for the guy to back out from his plans. The guy clearly had a gun and bad intentions, not to mention his ability to ninja walk through a forest where we even heard wild cats walking around. And also, no neighbors to witness or hear anything. Prior to 2016, I lived in Palmdale, California. 
My sister Honey and my youngest daughter lived with my mother in a rented townhouse apartment in Oxford, about two hours away. Every week or two, I made the long drive to take them shopping and clean their house because they were both disabled. But my mother was my heart and my sweet sister helped raise me, so anything they needed, I was always there for them. On the first floor, the kitchen was in the back with a door that opened to the backyard. Then a big open space and then the living room and the front door. On the right was the bathroom and my mother's bedroom. The stairs were on the left with a half wall railing going up to the first landing. My mum was sitting in her lift recliner on the right facing the base of the stairs. The one night we were all sitting in the living room just watching a show with the lights on and my daughter was upstairs in her room. We were laughing at something we saw on the TV when I saw something on the stairs. It darted down the steps real fast, picking up at me, and then ducked back down behind the railing, followed by just a cold chill that entered the living room. My mother even commented that it was cold and put a robe together. At first, I thought it was my daughter playing tricks on me, but when she didn't pop up, I honestly felt concerned. So I said, Mama, did you see something? Because she had full sight of anything there. She said, no dear, I thought that I did, but there's nothing there. That's when it hit me, and instinctively, I just knew what it was and where it even came from. I ran up the stairs and burst into my daughter's room, and I said, what did you do? She looked at me with her eyes wide. She knew exactly what I was referring to and started apologizing. I told her, tell me what she did to bring it into this house, and she proceeded to tell me that when her girlfriends were there, that they thought it would be fun to try and summon a spirit. Then they tried to reach the father of one of her friends who passed away two years prior, but she said something else came through and it scared them, so they stopped and her friends ran home without even saying goodbye. And well, I was furious. I said, how dare you play with something you don't understand? I told her that I knew that she was just trying to help her friend, but for heaven's sake, I warned her years ago to never mess around with things that she didn't understand and had no control over. I was thinking that not only do I constantly worry about my family's health now, but I have to worry about this. I asked if she at least closed the door, and she just looked at me with a blank stare, and obviously, she didn't. She said that they made a Ouija board out of paper and that when they were done, she just ripped it up and threw it away. I told her that that door had to be closed. So we gathered the pieces and she called her friends. Two of them were too scared to come back, so we had to perform the closing without them. But in the back of my head, I knew that it didn't work and it was still there hiding somewhere. At that point, there was nothing that I could have done viewing the circumstances at the time. So fast forward to 2016, I had an opportunity waiting for me in Washington State, so I begged and pleaded for my mother and sister to go with me, but my sister Honey was fanatically scared of change, and although my mother desperately wanted to go with me, she just couldn't leave my sister's side. I wish now that I would have been more persistent. So I moved, reluctantly leaving them with my daughter and her now husband to take over their care. And within those two years, my elder sister Honey's health severely declined and my mother shared with me eight months after I moved that she was diagnosed with stage 4 cancer. And I flew and drove back and forth to be with them and every time I showed them pretty pictures of my new life and our beautiful green surroundings, asking them to return with me and every time, Honey would say that she was just too apprehensive to leave and said no. And in 2018, they both passed away. My mother from cancer and my sister from an existing illness, taking a big part of my heart and my soul with them. My daughter and her husband moved out, leaving all of my mother and sister's things there. But somebody had to put their stuff in storage, and of course it had to be me. And even though I was the youngest of six, I felt it was my duty. I drove there with my two grandchildren, eight and four, because at the time there was just no one available to watch them. And when we arrived, the place was just in shambles. Dirty dishes and moldy food lined the counters and was piled up in the sink and it looked like soot just all over the floor. Mum and Honey's personal belongings were strewn around the house and in my mother's room, a barricade of trash was piled up all the way to her door. 
In the middle of the floor in the open space was a full-length mirror that I had never seen before, just hanging off of a wooden ladder. And quite honestly, I just stood there and I cried. I set up a clean spot in the living room for my grandson to play on his tablet with and my granddaughter wanted to help. As I was bagging things up in the kitchen, I noticed her just standing there staring into the mirror. I didn't think anything of it, but she just kept standing there. Then I heard her say to me while I'm not looking away, Nana, can you get rid of this mirror? I thought she wanted to move it, but she was adamant that it had to be taken out of the house. I asked her why she looked so scared, and she told me that while she was looking into the mirror, she was standing there alone, and she couldn't see anything in the reflection around or behind her. Just darkness all around her, and she felt like something was coming. I looked at the mirror too, not at myself, and I must admit that it did look very dark. It was strange because it really shouldn't have been, but it was. So, say no more, not only did I take it outside, but I smashed it into a million pieces and threw it in the trash can. But we decided to sleep in the living room, and it took days to even come close to being done. But this happened on the last night, and we were alone. I just mopped downstairs, so I locked the doors and all the windows in the whole house, and we slept upstairs in the bedroom across from my daughter's old room. We hunkered down on some mattresses on the floor, and I always left a light on in the hall. I'm reading a book online. My granddaughter had fallen to sleep next to me, and my grandson was on his tablet at the end of the bed. I was getting sleepy, and my grandson started to yawn. He looked up from his tablet, and his eyes got big, and... He ran to the door and shouted, Spooky, and slammed it, running back to me quickly and got under the covers and got as close to me as he could, making me feel really uneasy. And when I looked, I could see movement in the hall, dimming the light around and under the door, making swirling strange shapes as if someone were pacing, followed by surges of blackness and wisps of cool air coming from the space under the door. And that night was long. I felt on guard until I finally fell asleep as well, but I woke up hours later and had to go to the bathroom, but I was just too scared. I was just laying there waiting until daybreak, but I just couldn't wait any longer. So I slowly opened the door, fearing for what was waiting for me on the other side, but when I did, there was nothing. But at the same time, I just knew that there was something there. I could feel it. I tried to be as fast as I could and I left the bathroom door open so that I could hear the kids and then I ran back. Hearing a swoosh behind me, I slammed the door and laid holding the kids until daybreak. I received a call from my sister later that morning and she couldn't understand how we would have been able to stay in that house. When I asked her why, she told me that when she was there grabbing some boxes of pictures, she heard noises coming from my daughter's room upstairs. She said that it was loud and she just felt like an evil presence, and everything inside of her just told her to leave, and so she did. She also told me that my son-in-law, for which I had no knowledge of at the time, was practicing some black magic and summoning dark energy in that room, which obviously was not cool. But late that afternoon, when everything was done, where the kids were in the car and the car was packed, I just wanted to look at my mother's bedroom one last time where she used to sleep. These walls held just so many memories. I felt like if I looked hard enough too, I would see her laying where the bed had been and in my mind telling me just not to cry. But as I stood there in the doorway, a chill just went up my spine and the hairs on the back of my neck and my arms started to raise and I could feel something closing in on me. And then, and I'll never forget this as long as I live, in my ear, I felt a warm breath and heard one loud word, and it said, run. And boy, did I run out of that house so fast, not even bothering to lock the door. And to top it all off, as we were driving off, my granddaughter asked me who that was, standing in the window upstairs. Desert is a scary place for me now. It used to be a place filled with peace and serenity, but since living out there for almost 30 years, 
you see things. This occurrence took place in the high desert of California in the mid-90s. The whole town was once all military. There's a military plant there and a prison. The streets to this day consist of numbers and letters. An example would be Avenue O with 178th Street. You've always heard noises of people missing and underground tunnels, which are confirmed here. In fact, a friend of mine kept getting a draft coming from his closet in his childhood home. And later, after he grew up, he checked it out and found an opening to one of these such tunnels. He actually called me over to check it out, but I was too freaked out to go more than 10 feet in when I turned around and just told him that this might be how people disappear. You always saw things late at night off in the distance, far past the lights of that then small town. Strange glowing lights that shot straight up and the things in the sky, just stuff you never talked about really. But life was carefree back then. If you wanted to visit friends though, you would have to drive down long desert roads and sometimes end up coming home late at night in the pitch black because there were no street lights. I remember coming home late one night with my boyfriend at the time and another friend and we pulled over for some reason. I don't know why, but something just compelled me to get out of the car and look up at the stars. We were in the middle of nowhere, but we could hear what sounded like machinery and muffled clanks like from metal or something. We all started looking around, but we just didn't see anything. But just then, we felt a vibration under our feet. I crouched down on the street and put my ear to the ground, and it was coming from under us. We all listened intently and heard far down voices, but couldn't make out what was being said. We all stood up and were discussing what it might have been when we saw a small red light on the horizon, and it was getting closer. We piled into the car and at that point we just got out of Dodge. But we only told a few friends and they experienced the same thing which was weird. A year later I told a friend that I had started a small hauling business but there was a big job so I needed to borrow a trailer. And he said that he had a few that I could use so I should come out to his property and check them out. It was just starting to get dark when we pulled out this new toy. It was military grade night vision binoculars and he told me to wait until it got dark to leave because he wanted to show me something creepy. And I was all in. So later we walked to the back of his property looking out at pretty much nothing. No lights, no roads, nothing but barren deserts. He pointed the binoculars east and oh my, there were people out there coming out of the ground and moving around. I said, what the hell am I looking at? And he told me that his family called them ground dwellers and they're located in various parts of the desert. It honestly gave me the heebie-jeebies and needless to say I never went to his house after dark again after that. Now at one point we were living in a mobile home park past Avenue F. There was a huge tree house in my yard left by the former renter and the only way to get up into it was a hole that was cut into the tree with a door on it. Under that was a rope ladder and one night, I was sitting on the porch just drinking a cup of tea when I heard something move up the treehouse and then a head pop up. It was a, a lady and her husband hiding. It, clearly, I thought that they were on drugs and I told them to come down from there, but they didn't want to. It wasn't until I threatened to call the authorities did they cautiously comply, looking all around, not wanting to be seen. By now, there was a small group of my friends and nosy neighbors gathered around. I saw that she was terrified by something though, so I asked them to come in and I made them something to eat and waited for her to come down. She pulled out these papers, looked like legal documents with government letterheads or something. Some of them had embossed seals and they had smoke damage with a few of them even burnt on the edges. She told me that they were checking out this place off of Barrel Springs Road. There were two or three cinder block structures there and I knew them well. A few years back I happened upon that place and a black truck rushed down to greet me with guns drawn. She said that the same thing happened to her but she was in one of the structures so she grabbed some things and her and her husband just ran. I went over these pages and felt really uneasy reading them like this was stuff people get killed over if it got out. Stupidly I said why don't you just simply give them back. She said that they'd been running and everywhere they stop, a black car or van with government plates show up and sit there just watching them. Well, I really didn't want to get involved with this, especially after reading what I did. 
It was too big for little old me, and I'll take what I saw to my death, so I packed them a lunch and told them that they could sleep in the treehouse for the night. And they did, but they were gone early the next morning. After that too, we started seeing black vans parked in our lonely road facing the house. At one point, I was so fed up of seeing them that I just went up to one, but they took off as I knocked on their blacked out driver's window. The things kept happening out there in the desert too, but you don't see much now. I think that this is probably because there's more lights and people now. Towns and cameras and phones pointing everywhere too. But there weren't cell phones back then to call for help and video and whatnot. Anyway, on another day we were having a bit of fun. Some friends and I were in this stupid little red car called a Yugo that seemed to be on its last legs most of the time. And my friend's uncle had told him that there was a whole abandoned town far west from here. And there were things just left there all over the place too. And we was so dumb. It took us a long time to get out there thinking that we were lost a few times and then we started seeing some things. A carnival ticket booth on a trailer, broken tractors and furniture, little shacks here and there and empty water bottles just everywhere. There wasn't a store or place of business for many many miles. I wondered how anyone could even survive in a place like this and that was when we saw it. It was long and looked like a single wild mobile home, if you could ever call it a home, and it was between 60 to 80 feet long and it was raised. It looked like something from a horror movie, if I'm being honest. It had windows lined all the way down the front of the house with old frayed curtains still hung up and blowing in the breeze. There were open sections of missing siding under the house and there were dusty cars with their doors and trunks open, open cans and trash just all over the place, and a small fire pit in the middle of this. And one of the guys that I was with, his girlfriend and I, we saw people not wearing any clothes inside that house and they were watching us from the windows and from the open spaces under. They were following us as we were driving the length of the house too and they almost looked inhuman. They had really big eyes and really pale skin, much too pale for the desert. But he pulled up next to the fire pit and despite us screaming to go, he turned off the car and his girlfriend began to cry out that we have to leave right now. He didn't see what we saw and he said, stop babe, this stuff is cool. Man, I wanted to punch the guy. But we both kept looking at the people watching us while begging him to start the car back up. He picked up a long bone and was moving the spot around and said, hey, it looks like somebody cooked a dog. And just then, he looked up as his girlfriend leaned over the driver's seat and grabbed his jacket, and he saw, finally, what we were seeing, and said, Oh shit, quote, This thing under the house was just swaying back and forth with its hands on both sides of the opening, just staring at us, almost with intent to lunge. When we all saw this, he tried to start the car, but it failed. Thinking, too, that this was my end, eaten in the desert, I started to beat on the back of his seat, screaming, please start this thing. And after three tries, it started, and we just tore out of there, leaving a cloud of dust. Eventually, we pulled over far from that location and tried to compose ourselves. We didn't talk about what we saw after that, even in the car trip home, because I think that we were in disbelief that it even happened. There were so many things that occurred in the desert back in the day, too many to even come close to tell you guys, but I do believe that there are things that we just do not understand, or maybe never will understand. Just a tidbit of information too, Rosemond, way back way in the day, was a, a toxic dump site. That's why the houses were so cheap, but if you ask anyone now, they just don't know what you're talking about. This story literally just happened this morning at around 6am. I feel the need to share it too because it's just been on my mind all day. So I was leaving for work this morning. I had to be there early so it was still pitch black outside. And there was not a lot of lighting on my street so you really can't see anything without headlights or a flashlight of some kind. So I get into my car and drive to the end of my street and come to a stop at the stop sign. And just then I noticed that there was a woman standing on the other side of the street, just standing there. 
at this point, I probably hang at the stop sign for a couple of seconds because now I'm a little concerned that there's a woman just standing on the side of the street in total darkness. Weird, right? And then she notices me. This is where it starts to get a bit scary too because she turns to look at me and just out of nowhere starts sprinting full speed at my car. This isn't even like normal running we're talking about as well. Her arms are way out to her sides and the only way I can really describe it is like a zombie would run in a video game or something. And she was going fast too. All I know is that she was definitely coming straight at me and she looked like she wanted to hurt me as well. I went into full panic mode. I hit the gas pedal so hard. I must have been going like 60 in a residential area. But at that point, I just did not care. But once I got a little distance away, I looked in the rear view and I can still just barely see her chasing right after my car and that was the end of the story she was going fast but of course she couldn't catch up with my car and I got away but man it was a terrifying way to start a day I tell you I have no idea who this lady was or what her intentions were or anything all I know is that it's left some fear on my bones Two weeks ago, while I was reading on the couch in my living room, I heard a knock on my door of my flat. I wasn't expecting anyone that day, and it's rather unlikely that it was one of my next-door neighbors, since on my floor, we're all students who come and leave after a year or two and don't really need to meet each other anyway. Mind you, there isn't any peephole on the front door, so I couldn't see who it was either. A few seconds after the knock, though, the voice of a middle-aged man says through the door, I'm here for the water meter. Now, that was weird. I sent the previous week the water meter reading to the estate agency, so it's still sitting. I shout back to him that I already sent it. And there's a few seconds pause before he adds, I need to see it. I say, why do you need to see it? He pauses again before asking if I can open the door. I get up, start walking to the front door, next to which is the bathroom and the water meter. I tell him that I'm going to read the numbers to him through the door and do so. There's that awkward pause again and he says, thanks, and I expect to hear his footsteps in the corridor while he leaves. I live in an attic room in an 18th century building with old creaky wooden floors and stairs and thin walls as well, so you can hear people walk or talk on the phone or basically anything, but it just remain silent. At this point, I know that he's just standing right behind my door, and I have an ominous feeling when, after like 30 seconds, I don't hear any steps, and put the bathroom's door wedge under the front door without moving away from the entry. After a minute, I take my phone and I start dialing my mum, and this is the moment where I can hear him leave. I get my mum on the phone and proceed to tell her what just happened. She's even more on guard than her daughter and decides to send an email to the estate agency from which we rent the flat from so we can know if it was just a misunderstanding. Like the water meter guys were just not warned that the agency got my water meter reading or was simply late or something like that. And we got their answer a few days later because they never sent anyone. They went through several options though. It could have been the landlord who came himself, unlikely but possible, or the syndicate of tenants. They then detailed in their email that they called the owner, who was several hundred kilometers away at the time and never sent anyone, which is all to say that the man was never sent by anyone. He managed to get into a building protected by two entry codes and directly went to the last door, to ask to be left inside a flat rented by a lone female student during one of the few moments of her schedule she's there during the period of the year where tenants give their water meter reading and didn't ask any other tenants despite the fact that he should have had the list of who communicated it and who did it. I still don't know how he did it and who he was despite our best efforts. I have that ominous feeling sometimes thinking that I could have naively just let him inside. I probably would have, in fact, if my mother didn't remind me to send my reading and if I didn't smell that fishy smell. Or the fact that he knew exactly what to do and when and who his target was. I'm moving out soon to another city for my studies and you can't know just how relieved I actually am.
When I was 18, I worked at a local Target. This is when we used to have a wall next to the registers of Pokemon, baseball, collectible cards, etc. And a Starbucks in front of the register by the front doors. But for context too, I'm a female. Well, one day, I was filling in this wall with some more cards and an awkward tall man came up and started looking at the Pokemon section next to me. He asked, do you like Pokemon? And I said yes, which then led to us talking about Pokemon. I didn't think much of it. He picked some, checked out, and then he left. Three days later, he returned to the store, finds me, and buys me candy and tells me to have a nice day. So... Things start escalating at this point. He would come in frequently, just looking for me, started sitting at the Starbucks tables and watching me while I work, which then eventually he started buying me more candy, Starbucks drinks, flowers, and then little girl panties, pacifiers, little girl hair accessories, which, of course, I'm freaked out now. I tried telling my bosses, but they couldn't really do anything about it. Called the cops, and they couldn't do anything either. He actually followed me to the back room one day since I started leaving the registers whenever he came into the store. And that was when we were able to call the cops because he cornered me in the back room. But thankfully, our stockroom guys were back there to basically save me. We were able to get a restraining order on him for the store so he couldn't enter anymore, but that's when he started waiting outside for me, following me to my car and leaving love notes on my vehicle for me to come out to. Honestly, it was terrifying and my mum knew too, but again, we just couldn't do much. One day though, he actually followed me from my work to my mother's house where I lived at the time. I'd never seen his car until this day and stood outside the house singing love songs and reading poems to me, but really loudly too, and my mother called the cops, but we kept telling him to leave and when the cops got there, they finally were able to get him to go away, but... Now he left me notes in my house, sent me letters and packages with porn, sexy outfits, girly panties, baby stuff, etc. During all of this too, my mum and I were trying to get a restraining order on him ourselves and charge him for harassment. But it's not like it stopped him. Finally though, one night, I was coming home from work and he waited around the corner of the house and he actually attacked me. He grabbed me around my face and dragged me to the ground. I screamed so loud and so much that, luckily, I had neighbours come outside and help me. He was arrested at that point, and I had enough evidence saved up to be able to take him to court, and now he's been in jail for eight years. But he's due to be released in 2021. He's actually in the Jester 4 unit. He was stalking another local girl that I connected with so we could help each other out after he got sent away, that is. She was just starting to get his attention, so luckily she never got hurt, like I did. So, this is still an active situation that we're trying to figure out how to deal with. It's going to be a bit of a long one, but... The details are needed to give you an idea of just how crazy this whole thing is. So, I'm 29, female, switched up my career in healthcare to follow my dream of learning how to work on cars. I was hired this past May at a dealership as a quick service mechanic and fell in love immediately with everything about it and my co-workers. I had noticed how cute my trainer was and not only was he cute but he was very patient with training me too. I was so new to working on cars that I needed to learn the basics and he was really helpful and nice about everything. His name was Nick and he was 40 and male. Me and Nick had actually hit it off in every way as well. He asked me on the first date to go geocaching which was great because I love that stuff and Nick and I have been side by side since then. I always really loved everyone I worked with, always laughing and playing pranks on each other, but also always helping each other and busting our asses to make the customers happy. I should add too that my best friend works there as well, and another good friend of ours had gotten hired too. We were a close-knit family in the quick service department. And well, I didn't make it past my probationary period because I was just a bit slower. So Nick has a full mechanic garage at his dad's place, and I'd meet him after he got off work so we could make some side job money. 
about a month and a half ago, Nick and I decided to get an apartment together and it's been amazing. I've been bringing him to work, grabbing him on lunch breaks and picking him up, which I love because I can also say hey to all of my old co-workers. That being said, I should add that Nick doesn't have any social media and we are together literally all the time, except for when he's working, obviously. But here's where things get crazy. So I got a message request on Facebook from some random girl saying, I can't believe what I'm seeing. Nick is my man and he's in your profile photo with you and he's been my man for seven months. I immediately went into panic mode, called him at work asking who this girl is and he was honestly just as confused. The more I talked to this girl though to try and figure out what the hell is going on, the more she said weirdly specific things about Nick, like the truck that he drives, they meet up at his dad's shop, which no one would know about his dad's shop because he never talks about it. She knew his phone number and pretty much everything, but she could never provide proof, screenshot conversations, photos of the two of them, nothing. We got to the point though where it felt like this thing was real and that her and I were going to team up but she just never answered my calls, my only messages. But after Nick and I had a huge talk about it, I knew that something wasn't right about this girl and I just had to get to the bottom of it. But I started getting pretty scared one day when I dropped Nick off after lunch. A minute went by and I got a message saying, damn, Nick looks sexy in that hoodie today. And this really shook me up. I asked what color and she said the correct color and... At this point, my first thought is, Stalker is like actually watching us. I told Nick about how she knew what he was wearing and he was super creeped out. Then, when I pick him up, I'll usually park by the quiet side of the building where no one can really see me. This time though, a work truck drives by me really slowly. I pretend not to notice him because I was in no mood to chat with anyone and I recognized the driver as a former co-worker of mine that I had only spoken to maybe two times during my time at the dealership. However, we were friends on Facebook and within a minute of him passing me by, the girlfriend messages me saying, you're waiting for Nick on the side of the building right now. And in that moment, I started to freak out. This dude is pretending to be my boyfriend's girlfriend. Then, after talking to Nick about it, we find out that, yeah, he's the only one from work that knows that Nick's dad had a shop. Nick had worked on this guy's truck before. They aren't friends, but they chat here and there, and, well, not anymore, but I just don't know why. He was saying such gross things to me as he was pretending to be my boyfriend's girlfriend. And if he's capable of doing this... Who knows what else he's capable of. He's also a giant dude in his 40s with children of his own. I have no actual proof of course, other than the fact that Andy Tinder this girl was active on, so was he. I see this dude every day too and Nick still works with him. He's in a different department than Nick, thank god, but still. So yeah, I'm still not sure what to do about any of this. This happened when I was about 23, female, and living on a quiet street of a busy road. It was a good neighborhood and I never really felt unsafe. Well, except this night. So, I was walking home at about 11.30 and there were still people about when I passed the Tesco Express around the corner from my flat. As I walked past, a man came out and I noticed him stop, but didn't think much of it. I continued up and around the corner onto my road, which seemed deserted. I had my headphones in, silly I know, but I noticed someone behind me. I glanced back and noticed a man with Tesco bags, but he didn't worry me yet. Now, before I continue though, I have to explain the layout of my flat. We, my parents and I, had the two bottom floors, ground and lower ground. Our bedrooms were on the ground floor by the front door, and the kitchen and the bathroom, living room and the dining room were on the lower ground floor. The front door was also on the side of the building, so you're perpendicular to the street when going inside. So I get to my front door and something catches the corner of my eye. I look to my right, to the street, and Tesco man is just standing there, staring at me. He was standing in front of a street lamp, so his face was dark. 
I quickly got myself inside though and I dropped my bag in my bedroom and heard soft knocks coming from the front door. I could see the front door from my room so I crouched low and quietly locked the front door from the inside hoping that he didn't hear or see me but he just kept knocking softly. I slipped downstairs when my parents were watching TV. I was freaked out but embarrassed so didn't mention it. I figured that he would give up soon and just go away. I sat in the living room with my parents, but being closest to the door, I could still just hear him knocking, and my parents didn't hear it right away. Eventually, I went to get some water from the kitchen, and when I came back out, my mum was at the foot of the stairs. She said, Hey, um, I think somebody's knocking on our door. The jig was up. Hey mum, I was too embarrassed to tell you, but some guy followed me home, and I think that's him at the door. What? Why didn't you say anything? We went upstairs and kind of stood by the front door. My dad came up and asked if everything was okay and I quickly called him up. My mum called first. Hello? On the other side of the door came. You alright? I think he thought that that was me speaking through the door, so my dad, in his sternest voice, said. Can I help you? Nah, you're alright. Came back. Listen, you need to leave before I call the police. I don't remember exactly what Tesco man said then, and it was some vague threat, but it was also obvious that he was leaving. After a few moments, we went outside to make sure that he was gone, and there was no sign of him. But because he knew where I lived, I was worried for quite some time that he would come back. Thankfully, we moved a year later, although I always loved that flat, so it was a shame. Around May of 2013, me and three friends from university were taking a gap year and decided to go travelling around North America. We're from the northwest of England. Up until this incident, we were in the US for maybe four months, but we left within a few days of this happening and just returned home. So our trip was what you would expect of three 20-year-old students. Lots of partying, drinking and drugs... We were relatively sensible though amidst all of this and never really done anything people would consider crazy or irresponsible. But we were renting a small flat and had about five or six usual spots that we would go to where we would meet people, mostly women, and we would get drunk and hopefully try and get lucky. But one particular day, we had been to the local supermarket to get some food and things for the flat. We took a cab and the driver seemed really friendly and we just got talking. And he told us about a pretty good place to go and drink and filled our heads with the usual full of hot women, cheap drinks, etc, etc. The driver even told us that he'd be going himself tonight and we should consider coming too and we could have a drink together. He was really interested in the English Premier League and wanted to pretty much talk about it because nobody there was into it at the time. So we arranged to meet him there around 930 He wrote the address on any piece of paper and said that any taxi driver will know where to take us. So we get ready, like many usual nights. We hail a taxi, and when we hand him the note, the first red flag, he looks back at the three of us and asks us if we know what this place is. We tell him about the other cab driver, and he basically warns us that it's an invite-only sort of place, and apparently things get a little weird in there. We decide to go anyway, but he also warns us that this is going to be a pretty expensive fare as it's maybe a 35 minute drive. I remember having second thoughts at this moment, but my friends just wouldn't be swayed, so off we went. We arrive a short time later and the place can only be described as just a derelict looking building, just on the edges of what seemed like an industrial estate. Pretty creepy looking back at it. We got out of the taxi, pay the fare, and head toward the building. There was a main door, but it was a huge double-fronted steel door, so we knocked, only for there to be no answer. We walked around the building and found a few guys having a smoke outside. We told them that we'd been invited by a cab driver and described him. That they knew who we were talking about and told us to just wait outside while they fetched him. But note also that these people were not welcoming or polite... They actually were pretty strange and seemed like they were trying to intimidate us. The taxi guy comes out and he isn't happy as earlier in the day but seems friendly enough and we go inside with him. 
This place was pretty dimly lit with the sound of music coming from below. It sort of sounded like it was underwater almost. He told us to wait while we went into a room and he came out with a stamp and stamped our hands. I remember the stamp was an orange circle with an X in the middle. We didn't think much of it. Just a small detail that I remember though. He tells us to follow him and as he promised, there was a pretty large area full of people dancing and seemingly having a good time. But something about it just seemed really off. It was as if it was either scripted or all of these people were just really tripping. It turned out to be the latter as well. But we started drinking and making small talk with people who were either too messed up to converse or just didn't seem interested in talking with us, so we made our own fun, started drinking a lot and tried to source some drugs. We found the taxi guy and he told us to give him some money and he'd bring us back some good stuff. So we did. He stuck to his word too and about 30 minutes later, we were pretty messed up but were still enjoying ourselves. But right here is where the night takes a turn. A guy approaches us in a long jacket and asks us some questions. Where are you guys from? Are we armed? And some others that I can't remember. Pretty weird, but we just brushed it off. A few more guys who were his friends started talking with us, and after a while we agreed that we would go back to their place for a sort of after-party thing. And this was literally the worst mistake of my life. We get in the truck with these guys, and there was a few more following us seemed pretty normal at this point until we realized that nobody else in the truck was talking except for us and there was also no music it was kind of awkward and a little bit concerning and i started to panic a little at this point and i suggested that maybe we should just get out because we didn't know where we were and we should be getting back my two friends didn't argue too but the guy driving the truck just completely ignored us Eventually, though, we get back to this sort of studio apartment with two floors. It was very open plan except for a few chairs and some weird random art pictures propped up on wooden mounts. Again, no music, kind of weird, and at this point, I basically said to my friend something like, let's just slip out for a ciggy and we'll all just leave. But they wouldn't let us leave, basically telling us to have a good time and chill out till the others arrive. We were obviously pretty worried, and even though we hadn't been threatened or anything, something just seemed really off, until one of the guys who had not said a word the whole drive came and sat near us and plainly asks my friend, while taking a hold of his wrist, how much would I have to pay to watch you slit your wrist? We really didn't know what to say, and I tried to awkwardly just laugh it off. At this point, the drug and alcohol effects were wearing off, and I realized what a bad situation this is. So, I stand up and say that we really need to leave because we're busy the next day. Only to be told that we have to stay for a while. It wasn't an order as such, but it may as well have been. We flat out don't drink anything at this point, and we can't even talk amongst ourselves because the guy who asked about my friend's wrist is basically sitting right in between us. The taxi guy is nowhere to be seen, and another group of people arrived, and they were dressed really strange... To us at least, long coats, huge boots, fingerless gloves, usually something that we honestly would have laughed about, but in this situation, it just wasn't funny at all. After the new group conversed with the old group, they literally all walked to the part of the room where we're sitting in and asked us if we have any family in the country with us because they know that we're visiting. I think pretty quickly and say, yes, I gave my brother and his friends the address of the place that we went to initially and they'll be worrying. He flat out calls me a liar and we're all pretty terrified now. One of my friends was asking what they were doing with us and why they wouldn't let us leave. And after maybe another two hours of sitting on this couch and the other groups of the people standing in little groups and turning and shooting us looks every now and again, I get up and ask what time it is and I need to be going. I basically get told to sit back down and I don't need to be worrying about the time. Enter Taxi Guy. He comes into the room and straight away we make eye contact. He mouthed something to me but I couldn't make it out but I knew that whatever it was, it wasn't good. I stand up and walk toward him. He meets me halfway and tells me that he isn't allowed to be talking to me and that he's sorry. At this point... I'm actually considering that we may die in this place in some sort of crazy horror movie style cult killing. 
I return to my friends and tell them that I think they'll do something really bad if we don't find a way to leave. I remember the studio wasn't very high up in the building, maybe one or two flights of stairs, and that the main door wasn't open when we arrived. One of my friends stood up and basically said something along the lines of, Look, whatever you're going to do, either do it now or just let us leave. And literally, everybody except us and the taxi guy started laughing hysterically. Fear started turning pretty quickly to anger and I basically said to my friends, screw this, let's just walk past them. As we approach the door, one guy pretty much stands and blocks the door. In my head I thought if I shove him, open the door and run, maybe we'll get out. But basically before I got the chance, the whole group started beating us up, spitting, kicking, pretty much everything and I remember the taxi guy just trying to drag guys off of us but that was it. After they beat us up, I remember being dragged back down the same stairs as we'd brought in, and I also remember seeing my friends being dragged behind me as I was facing the opposite way. It was light outside now, and I see the main door. We were urinated on when we got outside and had petrol poured on us as well. I honestly too thought that I was about to be burned alive, and I was just sobbing. My friends the same. The whole ordeal ended a few minutes later and the guys got into the same two trucks and they left and we were bloody and covered in piss and petrol and terrified in the middle of practically nowhere. We basically ran the first chance that we got when the guys drove away in the truck. It took us about two hours of walking until we came across a petrol station. The man working there was horrified and called the police who arrived relatively quickly. He asked us if we could remember where this happened and we no longer had the piece of paper with the address to the place on it and none of us could remember the name. We were still pretty shook but we managed to direct them back to the building where we were locked in, still covered in piss and petrol mind you. None of the injuries we got from being beat up were too bad, just some bruises and a couple of cuts. We told the story maybe five or six times all in and were later informed of some other tourists who reported something very similar. The building that we were in was used for art shows or something, and the locks to the studio that we were in had been smashed off. This whole ordeal basically sparked agoraphobia within me, and after returning to the UK a few days later, it probably ruined the best part of my 20s, and still to this day, traumatizes me. But having a son and a family and such has helped me greatly. Whether it was a gang of lunatics just trying to terrify us, or whether they had other plans for us, but something happened, I don't know. But it was definitely the most terrifying time of my life. One of my two friends also had to seek counselling for this, and the other basically just won't talk about it. Just to add as well, we all did have phones, but when we were brought into the apartment, we were asked nicely to leave our phones in the truck as no one used phones because it would ruin the night because people would be antisocial. We were gullible and we agreed and that was really stupid. This happened in the year 2000. I was 21, living with my best friend in a two-bedroom apartment in a pretty rundown area. Fortunately, there was no crime, as it was all two broke kids just getting started could afford. I spent my days juggling classes at the local community college and just working retail. I was single at the time and would often spend my time online all night just on chat rooms and Usenet. I had met this girl too in a local area chat room and we'd been hitting it off, or well, so it seemed. I'd email her and we'd chat on ICQ. She had sent me a few pictures and I was really into her. She was pretty with a thick curvy body, which was pretty much my type. Her name was Beth and she had told me Beth by Kiss was her favourite song. So, this one rainy night in February, we were talking and she had asked me to come over. She lived a few towns over, maybe an hour away. But like I said earlier, we were hitting it off and honestly I found myself liking Beth a lot. And so, I jumped at the chance to actually meet her in person. We made plans for me to pick her up and go to the Waffle House. I showered and got dressed. Nothing too fancy. One of those long sleeve shirts with the stripe across the chest. Jeans, hoodie. I didn't want to overdo it, but still looked decent. By the time that I left, it was almost 11 and my roommate was asleep in his room. I headed out, excited and kind of nervous. In hindsight though, I really should have just stayed home. 
It took a lot longer to get there than I thought it would, probably thanks to the rain, but sure enough, her directions took me right to her place. It was a double-wide trailer in a rural area trailer park. I walked up the stairs of the front porch and I knocked on the door. I've always been pretty shy when talking to girls that I liked and I was still nervous when she opened the door. The door opened just a little and a little voice told me to come in. I walked in apologizing for taking so long in a little bit of a nervous daze. She said that it was okay and to have a seat so I sat on the couch and then for the first time as I looked up and at her I noticed that that was not Beth. This much older woman, maybe in her 40s, wearing only a bathrobe, sat down across from me. Now, I don't want to body shame, but I need to point out that she was huge. I'm a big guy, over 6 foot with a big host type body, and she was much bigger than me. I'm a big guy, over 6 foot with a big host type body, and she was much bigger than me. I glanced around trying to figure out what was going on. I saw pictures of the Beth that I knew on the wall, the same pictures that I'd seen during ICQ, and hey, who's that guy in the pictures with this older woman? I looked back at her and instantly noticed that she was staring at the clock nervously. I asked what was going on and she started mumbling nervously. Actually, imagine a child telling you what they'd done when in trouble. That's how she was talking, like a child caught red-handed. I pieced together that she used the other pictures of a girl around my age. I'm assuming the girl was a niece or something. And in her mumbling, she said that it was later than she realized and he'd be home soon. My mind instantly raced to a friend telling me that his uncle caught his wife using pictures of their daughter to lure younger guys over for anonymous sex. I quickly realized too that the guy in the pictures was her husband and I was in that very same situation. I fully respect others' relationships, and at this point, I was instantly ready to go. I was no longer nervous, and I just told her straight up that I wasn't going to mess around with a married woman. I told her to no longer contact me and that I was leaving. I was pretty pissed. I mean, not only had I been lied to, but I'd been cheated on before, and I know exactly what that felt like, and refused to have a part in doing that to another person. As I walked out the door onto the porch... She yelled, wait. I turned around instinctively to see her coming towards me, and she grabbed me and started trying to kiss me. I pushed her away and I told her to stop, and then her face just turned into a mask of pure insanity. She rushed towards me once again trying to kiss me. I tried to hold her back, but in a second, she tackled me knocking me over with her falling on top of me. She kept grabbing at me, grabbing at my private parts, kissing me and crying like a baby. She kept screaming for me to do her and I was trying to push her off but the fall had knocked the wind out of me. Not to mention, like I said, she was huge. I kept wrestling with her, trying my best and somehow worked my legs in between us. I pushed them up as hard as I could, knocking her off me and she stumbled up and fell over on her porch furniture. Adrenaline took over and I just ran as fast as I could down the stairs and straight to my car. As I was sliding into my seat... I saw her picking herself up at the bottom of the stairs. She must have fallen down them trying to get me still and I backed down the driveway and as I looked back before driving away, she was coming down the driveway too. Her bathrobe was hanging half off of her, her naked body was exposed and covered with scratches and dirt from her falls and whatnot. I just drove off as fast as my Ford Escort would take me. To this day, I still don't know how I didn't get into a wreck from constantly looking in the rearview mirror hoping that she wasn't following me. But I found my way back to the main road and before long realized that I had went the wrong way. I pulled into the first gas station intending to turn around. I noticed that nobody was following me and the gas station was well lit and had a few cars in it. I felt safe and so I parked, trying to get myself together after that insane scuffle. And honestly, I still find it hard to believe just how scared I was. If you would have seen that face and been through that tackle, you'd understand. But I collected myself and I got out of the car to use the bathroom and make sure that I wasn't hurt. The adrenaline was wearing off and random pain started creeping in and it was then that I noticed that the gas station was uphill overlooking that trailer park. I could still see her standing at the bottom of the driveway and it looked like she was holding her head just crying. 
At first, I kind of felt bad for her. I mean, I'm a nice person to a fault. I've often let myself get sucked into bad situations by feeling bad for a person that I shouldn't have. And I saw this crazy person crying, and I just felt bad. But then I remembered all of her crazy stuff and the pain creeping in making me wonder if she seriously hurt me. So I used the bathroom and I left. As I was getting back in my car, I looked back one more time and I saw a car in the driveway and a man was yelling in the front yard. I guess that he must have got home while I was peeing. I can't imagine what it would be like coming home to your wife standing naked in the driveway just crying like that. Judging by her mumbling before the insanity, I figured that she wasn't a good liar either. I got home the next day and told my roommate what happened. I didn't want to at first, I felt ashamed for some reason. Though, like I said, he was my best friend and he knew immediately when something was wrong. Not to mention that I was limping around anyway, and my entire body was killing me. And he figured that she was just unhappy in her marriage and maybe her screwing around made her a little crazy. Or maybe she already was crazy and the situation just set her off. Maybe she was on drugs or something. I don't know, but I cut off all contact and it's been almost 20 years since that night. I've never seen or heard from Beth again and I'm 41 now and I'm happily married. My best friend is still my best friend, even though he no longer lives in the state. We never really talk about it though. Outside of this, I've only talked about it to a therapist that I visited during a particular hard time in my life as well. My wife doesn't know, and I still feel pretty ashamed about it. The therapist told me that it was probably a form of a little bit of PTSD type thing or something. Not to mention the guilt from perceived gender roles, maybe, but who knows. In the end, I got away, and I'm thankful for that, but it certainly could have gone a whole lot different. So before I start retelling this particular experience, I want to preface it by giving my reason for sharing it. So this happened some years back and I've always been quick to just kind of push it off and try to forget about it, but a conversation that I had recently inspired me to write my story out so people with more experience of the paranormal or supernatural phenomena might tell me what I witnessed, if anything. This all takes place in northwestern Montana during the late autumn of 2009. When I was 17, I moved out of my parents and in with a co-worker, who I'll call John, in his trailer. We got along well at work, and we'd been part of the same weekly D&D group for a while. It was actually one of the better roommate situations I've ever had in terms of compatibility, and we became close friends during this time as well. We were roommates until shortly after I turned 18, and some personal stuff happened with my family, and I ended up moving back in with them for a while at least, so I could help them cover some bills. It took about three months for that situation to stabilize, and I called this friend up about moving back out there, and this was the first time I remember feeling like something was off, though it's been so long that I can't remember the details of the conversation, but just a, a sense of wrongness that lingered for a while after I'd hung up the phone. The end result, though, was that I was welcome to move back in, which I expected, I waited for a day off, and another friend, who I'll call Dave, came to help me move. Dave was another D&D pal from a different group, and we were figuring that we'd show up and talk John into my one-shot session or something. So we loaded up all my stuff, and we drove out there, and it was such a nightmare. But from the very moment that John opened that door, everything was just wrong. I won't say John was a clean freak, but he tried to maintain his space and he'd always insisted that we clean up for company when I was living with him. And I stood there, open mouthed, to see the thick layer of dust that just coated nearly everything. And the longer I looked around, the worse it got. And there was a half eaten plate of food turned to mold just sitting on the table. Both sinks in the kitchen were similarly moldy, and the air in the trailer just stank, even beyond what I'd expect for some moldy dishes. I was extremely taken aback by the state of the trailer, but the state of my friend was even more shocking. He worked at a bank, and he'd always kept himself clean, but now he just looked like a complete wreck. He'd lost weight, his skin had unhealthy waxy looks to it, his hair was overgrown and greasy, and his body odor was just terrible. His smell was the first thing that made me think that there's something really off about this situation. 
I'd been playing D&D and doing other nerd stuff for a long time, and I'm sorry to say that a lot of nerds don't have the best hygiene practices, but short story is that I've been in the presence of some pretty pungent body odor in my life, and this was not like that. It was almost the sickly sweet smell of something dead, but not quite. I've never really smelled anything exactly like it before, or even since. At this point, during the encounter, I'm at a general level of unease, and I didn't have any desire to go into the trailer. But John invites us, and not wanting to be rude, I go in. At this point, I'm thinking that something crazy happened while I was away. John wasn't dating anyone, so I'd figured that this was a depression resulting from heartbreak or something, and we kept in touch okay after I first moved out, and even when that fell off a bit, I still heard from our mutual friends about the D&D sessions that he was attending, so this was all just really weird. Regardless though, despite having not heard anything about it, obviously something had happened. So, standing there in this dusty living room with Dave, who is shooting me sideways looks the entire time, I ask John if everything is alright. After a full three seconds of silence, he assures me that everything is fine, just that he doesn't try to explain the state of his house or anything, and weirder yet, he goes, you guys can crash out here, and just heads off to the back of the house. I'd always known him to be a diligent host, so... This was odd to say the least. Although basically nothing was going as I expected or remembered up to this point, him ditching us in the living room of his nasty house was probably the least weird thing. And now comes the part where I'm pretty glad that Dave was there. To me, this nasty trailer was my home. I'd lived there for more than a year before my three-month visit to my parents, and I had a sense of belonging in the place, which I think made me oblivious to things that were obvious to Dave. Despite the state of things and being left alone by my friend, I hadn't made any changes to the plan of living there. I'd set my stuff down and started getting ready to do some cleaning, but Dave stopped me and started pointing out things that I hadn't noticed up to this point. The layer of dust was even and undisturbed across the entire living room and kitchen area, except for the thin track from the front door to the hallway leading to the back of the trailer. Whispering to me, Dave says... Nothing in here has been used for a long time. And, really looking around, I begin to realize that he's right. The TV, the computer, the couch and the chairs, the dining table with its rotten food. He hasn't so much as laid a hand on any of it for a month or possibly longer. Dave, almost as if he's sneaking, walks quietly into the kitchen to inspect the fridge. He points out a few thick patches of dust on the flatter surfaces of the fridge, but it's harder to tell here. The fridge's metal handle did have some dust, but it wasn't collected. Stepping past Dave, I reach out with one finger and I pop the fridge open. Anne was gagging before I'd even opened the door enough to trigger the interior light. Throwing my arm across my face and burying my nose in the crook of my elbow, I open the fridge about halfway and... It's just top to bottom with rotten food. I step back after a second, turning away and trying to suppress my urge to vomit. After I take a moment to collect myself, Dave draws my attention to a half gallon of milk that he pulled out of the fridge, indicating that it had expired three weeks prior. Personally, I just wanted him to put everything back and close the fridge, more or less done playing dust detective. I basically shrug off everything up to this point, clear some dust from the couch and get my laptop out and connect to the Wi-Fi. We'd always paid for the best internet available, but after a while Dave joins me and we played World of Warcraft for a bit. Eventually he tells me that he'll hang out for tonight because I'm his ride and taking him back to his place and driving back to the trailer was a 90 minute round trip. To be clear, I would have taken him home anyway. I wouldn't blame anyone for wanting to hang out in a room with a giant stack of moldy dishes in the sink and a fridge full of rotten food, but we played games on the computer for the next few hours and John just never made a noise. At one point, Dave asked me where the bathroom was and I told him that it was at the far end of the hallway next to John's bedroom. A low level of unease had been present since John first answered the door and was becoming more apparent the longer that we stayed. Normally, I don't walk with my friends to the bathroom, but it seemed like the right thing to do at the time. So I led Dave down the hallway, flipping on the hallway light as we go and covering my fingers in the dust from the switch. 
At this point, I must admit that I was actually starting to get annoyed with everything. I don't normally have bad seasonal allergies, but all the dust that we'd been stirring up had my nose itchy and half plugged. So, on my way back down the hallway, I think to myself that I'm going to point Dave into the bathroom and knock on John's bedroom door and confront him about the condition of the house. But halfway down the hallway, I realize that there's a hole in the floor outside the bathroom door. A jagged edge hole through which you can clearly see the dirt and the cobwebs and shredded black plastic that used to cover insulation. I sigh, exasperated now with the weirdness. I point Dave into the bathroom and I walk to the end of the hallway where John's room is. I wonder briefly if he's actually asleep as there's no light coming from under his door. The sun was setting but it's getting dark pretty early this time of year. Annoyed, I knocked loudly and after a few seconds I heard a grunt from inside the room. I pop the door open and flip on the light. And this is the point in time where it really starts to sink in for me how wrong this experience felt. I take in the room at a glance and it's much the same state as the rest of the house. Dust everywhere except for the track from the door to the nearest side of the bed. The bed itself was terrible. The blankets and pillows were stained a deep yellow, almost black in places and John just laid on his bed with a thousand yard stare turned on the ceiling. I instantly forget entirely why I even came to talk to John because looking directly at him, I felt the beginnings of what I can only describe as a profound fear, which even at the time seemed like an odd feeling to have in that situation. My sickly looking, clearly depressed friend, laying on his disgusting bed, paying no attention to me at all. I mean, it was weird that I felt so scared. John was not an intimidating guy. Short, kind of chubby and baby-faced, but in my gut, I was just terrified of him. I mumbled something about how I'd come to say goodnight, and turned off the light, and I shut the door. I turned around to find Dave kneeling by the hole in the floor, which, as I write this, makes me wonder how long I stood in the doorway to John's room for. If I had to estimate from where I left Dave to saying goodnight to John, only 15 seconds or so elapsed, but... He was already out of the bathroom, which was weird. As I approached, Dave points at the edge of the hole and tells me the wood along the edge is twisted upward, as if the hole was made from below. This part, I wish I could confirm to be true. I'm including it in my retelling of events because Dave did say to me, but I did not take the time to inspect the edge of the hole myself. Because right then, I was just at war with my own sense of fear that being in John's presence had sparked. I just nodded to Dave and I said, well, we should get back to the living room. Fast forwarding a bit now, I kind of came to my senses once we were back in the living room area and I had reopened my laptop. My sudden intense fear of John eased off and we played a few games for a few more hours before Dave said that he wanted to rest his eyes. When we shut everything down, I chilled out in a recliner and Dave laid down on the couch, positioned so that he could look down the hallway. I was just too uneasy to sleep over all that night and after looking into John's room I had determined that I wouldn't be living here after all. As much as I didn't really like living with my parents anymore, it was preferable to whatever John had going on here. Quietly I told Dave that everything was just all wrong and explained a bit how John as I knew him would never let anything get to this point. We weighed out the possibilities uh, psychotic break or maybe drugs. It occurred to me more recently that I should have considered the fact that he might have been seriously ill even. These are all still possible explanations to this strange behavior but my gut tells me that none of these are the answer. After a while we lapse into silence and at this point I'm just waiting for the sun to come up really starting to wonder why we haven't left already when Dave motions with his hand to get my attention. He kind of points towards the hallway and I turn my head slowly in the recliner to look and after perhaps 15 or so seconds of just staring hard into the darkened hallway, I hear a slight creak from the darkness. A little while and a few creaks later, I see John's darkened silhouette just standing just inside the hallway at the edge of the kitchen and that deep sense of fear just started to build in me. The only thing I can compare it to is once when out hiking alone, I ran right into a fairly decent sized bear going the opposite way on the trail. I had bear spray on me which I didn't end up using at the time but 
it was a terrifying experience and if I'm being honest, I've never really enjoyed hiking much since then. Just standing across from that monster of a bear with nothing between us awakened a terror in me so deep-seated that recalling the memory still gives me goosebumps. Alternatively, I've been face to face with a lot of crazy people and felt no such terror before. I wasn't fearless when trying to avoid a knife-wielding transient shouting gibberish at me, but it was a human threat if that makes sense. I realize that I've segued pretty hard from my retelling of events, but I feel making this clear as paramount because seeing John just lurking in the darkness of that hallway inspired in me a state of fear so powerful that I feel I have no choice but to look for unconventional answers as to what happened to my friend. Because the only thing comparable to that gut feeling of dread that my short chubby baby face friend created in me was the time that I ran into one of the largest terrestrial predators on the planet by myself on his home turf, far and away from any help, armed with nothing but a can of bear spray. There was something wrong and dangerous going on that I can't justify analytically, but my instincts told me that I was in danger in a way that I'd never been prepared for. But to fast forward to the end of this story, we lay there in silence while he lurked in the hallway for hours. When I questioned Dave recently, he tells me that it was at least two hours that John just stood there, allegedly just staring right at us. Eventually, he crept back down the hallway to his bedroom and quietly and quickly, we just got our stuff together and we snuck out to my car and we left. I did a little bit of a follow-up with our mutual friends afterwards, but got the same story from all of them. One day he just stopped coming around and later I heard from someone who spoke to his parents that he called them and said that he was leaving town and no one that I know has seen or heard from him since. I've mostly tried to forget that it all happened. For a while I'd have panic attacks when I thought about it. I realized that nothing overtly paranormal took place but my gut tells me that something well out of the ordinary was taking place in that spot. If anyone has any insights I'd be happy to hear it. And if you need any more details too, I'll answer questions to the best of my ability. And if you don't believe me, I don't blame you. My mother was a single parent of six, five girls and one boy, and I was the youngest. We were all opened up to the paranormal at an early age, and this took place in Hollywood, California in the late 60s. She knew that her kids were all different. She was very supportive, in fact, and never wanted to suppress our separate abilities. She would just tell us not to go around telling people because they would think that our family was crazy. And looking back at life with my mother, I kind of tend to agree on so many levels. Something she said to me that just always stuck with me was that people don't like what they can't understand. At the time, we were renting a house on Alexandria, but the owners wanted to move back in, so we had to move. Mum worked day hours, so the only time she could go looking at rentals was at night. All six of us would pile into this big yellow wood panel station wagon with a suicide seat in the back, and off we would go. Most of the time, a door was unlocked, and this was the 60s. All of us armed with flashlights, but we had to be quiet. The scariest times for me was when the doors were open, so me being the smallest, my brother would help me into a window so I could run to the door and open it for them. Now that I'm writing this, I believe that that was probably breaking and entering, right? Anyway, if there was a house that made any one of us uncomfortable, she would scratch it off her list and she would move on. It was hard to find a house that fit all of us, especially anything my mother could afford. But one day I came home from school and was surprised to see all of our stuff being moved to the house directly across the street where an old evil lady with her windows blacked out lived in the back. I finally found my mother and I asked her what was going on. She told me that she got a really good deal that she just couldn't pass up. She said just to stay away from that old lady. It was an old two-story house with wood floors, one bathroom and three bedrooms. It used to be four, but the fourth bedroom, a small portion in the back, was divided to accommodate another renter, that old lady. I must add too that I was young and very small for my age. 
There was so much room and so much commotion downstairs that my mother was understandably distracted at the time. I asked her why she didn't let me check the house for anything bad first and she said, look, there just wasn't time. It was a good deal and I had to take it. Why don't you go and check it now? Feeling very important, I went off to investigate. I went into the kitchen, big. I went into the dining room, fancy. And then I started up the stairs. Mum mentioned that there was a bedroom big enough for all of my sisters, a place for all my toys in the hall and a room for my brother, so I was excited to see this. The staircase was enclosed with a door at the bottom. We went up the steps to a landing where it turned and then proceeded up from there. So I got to the top step when they got me. It just felt like three cold hands, quickly, one after the other, grabbed around my throat with so much force. I tried to scream, but the grip was just getting tighter and I thought my vocal cords were being crushed. They started forcing me backward and I felt like I was about to fall, but they just held me there for what seemed like forever in my mind, my toes teetering on the edge of the top step. I couldn't move and it felt like surges of electricity were just running through my body. And then they started guiding me backwards down the steps, fearing at any moment that I was going to be thrown. I saw little spurts of my own breath coming from my nose as they were guiding me down and I could feel only the edge of the steps graze the tips of my toes while I was trying to grip one of them onto each step. They eventually got me to the landing and up at the wall. It felt like a thousand weights were pressing against my chest while I was still hardly touching the floor. I was starting to pass out when I heard a voice in my head say to me, you're strong, you have faith. I saw a white glowing light around me and I said something and... Then they lessened their grip ever so slightly, but it was enough for me to drop to the floor and run down to my mother. And as soon as I got there, I told her what happened. I said, please mum, please can we not live here? But she said that it was too late. We had nowhere else to go. It wasn't long before everyone else in the family had their own experiences too. We all hated that house, but we had to endure it until we could afford to move again. Now, my brother liked to tinker, and he liked to take things apart and see how they worked, if you will. He took the time to sometimes share that part of his life with me, and I'd like to think that that's where I got my inventor's mind and my ability to fix almost anything. He set up a workshop under the stairs in the basement. I sometimes found some of my electric toys being dissected in there, then put back together on that workbench. One day, I was looking for one of my toys and suspected that I knew right where to look, but... I was too scared to go down into the basement alone, so I took my trusted cat Frischka. I thought that he'll protect me. So I started down the stairs with my cat in my arms and I got almost to the bottom step when the lights went out and the door to the house slammed shut. Scared half to death, I felt for the railing and started to run back up when I saw something. Normally, you could see the moonlight from under the house through the vents to the outside that is and something moving was blocking the light out and quickly coming towards me. It almost looked like billowing black smoke from the back of the house. But just then, my loving cat Frischka hissed and clawed me to get away. He jumped from my arms and escaped through one of the grates on the other side. I ran up the stairs as fast as I could with my heart pounding out of my chest. I grabbed the door handle, jiggling it back and forth, thinking that it was stuck. And then I heard a loud, long exhale behind me, followed by the smell of what... I can only describe to this day as rotten eggs. The door finally opened and I just walked out and I slammed and locked it straight behind me. When I told my brother about this, he said that he never felt good down there too and he always kept the door locked after that. Now, my family was very involved in the church. We cleaned it every Saturday and helped with all the events and variety shows and whatnot. A funny thing though was that our family was so big that it felt like we were the variety show in the end. One such day though, they were all at church just doing something, I don't remember what. I had just arrived home from school and someone, I think one of my sisters, was supposed to be there to greet me. As you walk through the dining room on the left, you walked into the hall and you turn right and on the left is the boarded up wall to the tenant's dwelling behind us, with that evil old lady and just thinking about it gives me chills. And straight ahead was the bathroom. If you turn left into the hall, you see my mum's room that she and I shared together. 
next to that the door to the upstairs, and in the middle the door to the underhouse. And well, nobody was there, and I wasn't going to stay in that house alone, so I walked into the hall and I sat on the phone bench. For those of you who don't know what that is, it looks like a, a wooden end table with a padded seat on it, so you can talk on a corded phone. Anyway, earlier I saw my friend's dad's car parked across the street, so I knew my friend was home, so I figured that I would call him and just hang out there. I could just wait for someone to come home. But as I'm sitting there, I hear crackling coming from upstairs. It must have been one of my siblings, I thought, so I went to the bottom of the stairs and leaned in on one foot. I said, who's up there? And instantly, the crackling stopped. Thinking they didn't hear me, I yelled again, this time calling out a few of my sister's names, but still nothing. So I sat back down on the bench and I waited for them to come down. It was really quiet though and there wasn't really a sound after that. Just then, as I was sitting there, to the right of me, it sounded like someone was pressing their body against the other side of the boarded up wall, listening. Then, a muffled, quiet, evil giggle. It felt off, just really off. The crackling noise started back up again now, coming from the top of the stairs, followed by just an ear-piercing ringing inside my head. Feeling uncomfortable, I picked up the phone, not taking my eyes off of that staircase. I dialed my friend's number and before I could even say hello, I could see it as it turned the corner of the staircase. It was huge. It didn't have a human form but there were what looked like hundreds of eyes just all over it and it was pulsating a, a red amber. The deafening sound of crackling was coming from it with sparks flashing just all over its form. It was slowly gliding down the stairs coming towards me and I then heard more prominent laughter, almost like a cackle coming from behind that wall, and at this, I just ran. I dropped the phone and I ran straight over to my friend's house until someone came home later. Now, please keep in mind too that we only lasted six months in this house, so these are all the events that I know of within that time frame, and was confirmed to me by my siblings first hand. A brief description of where this next event took place though, because it was the second floor. Standing at the top of the stairs to the left, the back of the house was my brother's room. Inside the door to the right was a short wall and the foot of his bed. Alongside of his bed was a window. All of our beds in our houses always face east. Then a desk next to his bed and then an open space at the back corner near the closet. On the right side of the stairs was all of my sister's room. It was long and really big and it was set up as follows. So the closet was to the far right, then lined from the right to the left, four single mattresses on the floor, next to each other too, with all heads to the east, then a window. Now, my family were all avid readers, and that's pretty much all you could do back then anyway. But late one night, about 2am, my sisters were all laying on their beds reading when my brother burst open the door wide as a ghost, grabbing his neck, grasping for air, frantically telling them to all go downstairs. He briefly shared his experience and then just ran out of the room. At that point, he ran downstairs to wake up our mother. I witnessed this too because I shared a room with her. Actually, one of the beds upstairs was supposed to be mine, but I always complained about seeing a man hanging from a rope over the staircase landing. Plus, I had too many experiences up there myself, so I didn't like being up there. But the door swung open, slamming against the wall. He was standing there in a white t-shirt and PJ pants. There was no color in his face and his neck looked like it was on fire. He said that he was just falling asleep when he felt this really negative presence. Something caught his eye in the back corner of the room and it was the full body apparition of an old man and there was just hate emanating from him. He started to sit up but the man flew at him from across the room. He tried to describe it as it was quick, like one second he was there and the next he was on top of him. So fast in fact that the curtains and everything else in the room were affected like a big burst of wind. He grabbed his neck with both hands, gripping tight and was choking the life out of him. He said that he was nose to nose with this thing and to this day can't shake the evil image of his face. My sister and I both remember him saying at the time that the man in a guttural voice said to him, I want your body. My mother put a cold rag on his neck and sat there and tried to calm him down. We all remember dark bruises in the shape of two hands stayed on his neck for quite some time, 
and Chess too for at least over a week and he never slept upstairs again after that. Through the years he never really wanted to talk about this until I told him that I was writing our story now. Now on that night all of my sisters brought down their bedding except one. She was headstrong and stubborn, still is. She was the cut the crap it's all in your head type of person. That is until it happened to her. My elder sister tried warning her that on numerous occasions she saw something dark lurking in the closet and that one night she woke up to something pressing on her while she was sleeping. But that just still didn't deter her. We were all just dramatic and crazy. In the end she was happy because she got that big room all to herself. But one day she was upstairs taking a nap and she never slept without a fan on. The fan was located all the way across the room in front of that closet. The fan was round in the shape of a fat cat. It was about 17 inches tall and 14 inches wide with slats going around it, about 2 inches apart, with big metal blades. My sister always slept with her arm extended out from under her pillow, and she said that she was sound asleep when, all of a sudden, she woke up to her finger being sliced by the blades of the fan and just extreme pain. She pulled her hand out of the fan and ran downstairs to her mother. I remember that there was a lot of blood. My mother then wrapped her hand with a gauze and papaya so as to eliminate scarring, and we all went up to investigate. And the fan was still there, but it was unplugged. We just couldn't understand how it even got over to her. We had shag carpets, the 60s, so it couldn't have vibrated all the way over there. Plus, it would have had to have traveled over some articles of clothing that would have stopped it about five feet away from the bed. And you know, after having that happen to you, and the fact that your entire family is now sleeping together downstairs, and the fact that she saw the fan was unplugged, wouldn't that make you want to join everyone downstairs in the living room? Nope, not her. And she stayed sleeping up there for about a month until she was forced to believe us. By this time, she had made the room her own and she took two of the mattresses and put them on top of each other and put them both long ways under the window. And one day she told me that she was in the beginning stages of a dream state when she was fully awakened by pressure on her chest. She said that it felt dark and evil and she just couldn't move. All of these things were racing through her head when she remembered what our minister told her when we were in council about this house. He told her to try and communicate with it, ask it if it would follow her spirit guide into the light, and at this, the pressure started to get worse. And the more love she tried to send to this thing, the heavier it got. She said that it felt like a cement slab was just crushing her body and expelling all of her air. I asked her how she got out from under it, and she told me that she prayed and said some things our minister told us to say, and finally, it lifted. For the rest of the time that we were there, she slept in the living room with us after that. And in the end, we actually found out that a man did hang himself on the stairway there, and also that someone shot themselves in the closet upstairs. As for the old lady in the back, she was a very bad alcoholic who practiced the dark arts and some voodoo or something. She blackened out all of her windows to keep their energy happy. She apparently told the neighbor this. No one really paid her any mind though, they all thought that she was just crazy and she was an old lady who had just gone around the bend. But I often wonder just who she was before this and what made her that way. What was so bad in her life that made her want to torment others and even worse, innocent children? And was the evil man in my brother's room connected to her in some way? I guess that I'll just probably never know. Our minister told us in the end too that the house could never be truly cleansed until she was gone from it. So in the end we all just decided that moving was our last option. So let me preface this by saying that it is possible it could have been my imagination, considering how young I was at the time, but I want to know what you guys think and if something similar has happened to anyone else here. So I used to live on a military base in Hawaii. Father was in the Navy, and there wasn't much to do there. I don't know exactly my age at the time, but maybe around kindergarten? Hawaii didn't require kindergarten at the time, so I wasn't in school yet. I know that at least. 
But outside of our house, there was a covered car park that people in the community used because the houses didn't have garages and there were various storm drains that were around the car park. I would always play there since it was right outside of our house. Not the brightest move, but kids are dumb, right? But one day, I was playing there and I thought it would be fun to just drop things down the storm drain to see how far it went. I had dropped a couple of rocks and some small sticks and eventually ran out of things to throw in, so I started saying hello to hear my echo. I honestly didn't expect to hear anything other than my own voice, and I was surprised when I got a response. And a little girl called back to me. I wasn't scared, but just confused. I asked her what she was doing down there, and she said that her and her family lived down there. I remember I kept trying to look closer in, but it was just so dark that you couldn't see the bottom at all. The storm drain went right down and was covered by a grate. Not like the drain Pennywise used, for instance. But we sat for a while and we talked. I don't really remember the whole conversation that we had, but it went on for quite some time. I vividly remember, though, the last part of it because I felt so guilty and just hurt. Years later, in fact, I still do, even though I'm not sure if this even happened. So she wanted to play with me and I said that I could invite her in for dinner and she got really excited by that idea. So I ran inside and I asked my mum if my friend could come over for dinner. But she unfortunately said no and wouldn't let me go back out to tell her. But the next day I rushed out to explain to my friend what had happened but she just wasn't there. And after that I just never heard from the little girl in the drain again. I remember crying that day and I blame my mum for me losing my only friend that I had made there. My mum still remembers this happening too and just how upset I was but again, what do you guys think? So first of all, I want you guys to know that everything I'm about to share is real. I've talked to several people about the happenings in my room and in the past few months I've looked for help, searched for clues and explanations and tried to make it somehow stop but it just hasn't. Now a few things to know. I'm 20 years old and I'm living on a shared flat with four other people. I've lived here for three years now and the other people are all around the same age since it's an apartment for students. And the first creepy thing started right away when I moved in. So for the first time in my life, I actually started to experience sleep paralysis. Before this, I didn't even know it existed, just after the first time I got them. Sometimes I would get them every night, and sometimes they would stop for like weeks or months at a time. But in my paralysis state, I feel like there's another presence in my room, and I see a dark silhouette walk around my room, standing next to me, standing in front of the door, sitting on the chair, etc., but as much as I know this is pretty common in these kinds of paralysis situations, the really creepy thing started happening like two months ago, and until then I just lived with it. To be honest, I don't really know when or exactly what started it, but I remember my Wii console just randomly booting up one night, just in the nights as well, and it sounded as if somebody was trying to put a CD in, like just the sound of the console itself. Or as if somebody pressed the button on the console to output the CD inside, but there was nothing in it. It was like this mechanical rotating sound, and I hope you understand what I mean at this point. I would always turn her off again, but it was not unusual to have this happen a few times in one night. I even moved my television with the console to another socket, but it just didn't change anything. So, one day I just got sick of it, and I unplugged it, and left it as it is. But the next thing I know is that after 10pm I heard scratches at the walls every night. At first I thought that it was just rats or something like this, but the walls are made out of concrete here and are gapless on the insides. I know that since I once drilled a hole in it because I wanted to hang up a mirror. The walls of the whole building were made up of cement bricks placed on one another. I also heard something like sneezes, hard to explain, but in a very high-pitched voice, like a, a child. Sneezes or maybe hissings or something. I can't really explain it because it's hard to, but when I talked with my flatmates about this, they said that they never heard scratches on the walls, but one of them told me that he had once heard loud, heavy footsteps at around 3.30 in the morning. 
They were fast and it sounded like someone walked around in a panic, but he didn't dare get out of his room to check out who was there, since it was on a day when all of us were working full time and were sleeping. Another time he heard loud knocking at the door and he asked all of us if it was one of us, but yeah, it was nobody. But anyway, these scratches and sneezes continue and I freaked out in the first week, but I just kind of got used to it after a while and just ignored it. I didn't investigate further thinking that there must be some sort of explanation for it. But now comes the part where things really got out of hand. So my grandmother vanished around three weeks ago. She lives in Moscow in Russia. She had a very good pension fund every month and lived by herself in a flat. My relatives didn't visit her a lot. She was alone a lot, but the crime scene in Russia is huge and not in control of the police. But when she vanished, my relatives and the police thought that a few criminals kidnapped her when she was outside the flat by herself, going grocery shopping or something like that, so that they could get the money monthly. The police found out that the money was regularly taken from her bank account, but when they investigated her flat, nobody was around and there was absolutely no trace of her. So after a few days of hearing these scratches, I come home and got on my computer and what I experienced next was really odd. So I have like one favorite position when I sit on my chair in front of my desk. When I first sat there, everything was fine, but then I went quickly to the bathroom to fill up my bottle of water. The bathroom is right next to my room. So I went there, left both of the doors open, filled my bottle, and meanwhile I hear absolutely nothing. And neither did I see someone walk by or anything, but when I got back, I got back into my favorite position as always. And after a few seconds, I noticed that my socks were just soaking up with some cold water-like fluid. I immediately got up and, of course, investigated. It really looked like water, and it honestly felt like it, but it smelled like nothing. At first, I thought it was piss or something from an animal, but there was absolutely nothing in my room. We have no floor heating, and the other heater, which is attached to the wall, is on the other side of the wall. And except for the only bottle that I took with me, I have no other bottles or fluid in my room. It couldn't have come from the wall because it was a few inches away from it. And it had quite a lot of it and was thick with water. Like, it was a lot. Also, the most mysterious thing is that the base of the puddle was basically unreachable. Which I noticed when I was cleaning it up. The puddle was under a shelf and the space in between the floor and the shelf was like one inch or even less. Which means that a bottle, if it was for example a prank from one of my flatmates or something, wouldn't even have had enough space to get down there in the first place. And so, that night was pretty awkward. There were more bad vibes than usual in my room for some reason. And that feeling that I just wasn't alone in my room was way more intense than normal. Of course, this could have all just been in my head, but I have two alarm clocks, one physical one and one on my phone. The alarm was set at 6.30 on both of them, and that morning the clocks rang. I woke up, pretty exhausted, and I switched the clocks off and get my phone to check Facebook, etc. And since I was super tired, I fell asleep again by accident. And when I woke up again after that second little nap that I took, I of course panicked since I thought that I was going to be late for work. But when I checked how late it was, the clock showed me that it was 6.20am. I saw that both of the alarms were still set on 6.30 but turned off, which was really weird. And not only this, but on my phone, the apps were still open. So I was awake and must have switched the alarms off or something, but I swear that I did hear the alarms last night. Anyway... Continuing on with the rest of the cases, the scratches and the sneezes continued. To my surprise, I didn't experience any sleep paralysis in this time, which again was strange, but we didn't hear anything from my granny. The police didn't put much effort into her case though, since it already was just an old woman. I knew that she was really religious and prayed for me and my brother regularly. I'm not religious at all, and honestly, I didn't believe in ghosts before this incident. But I think the paranormal activity in my room just got a lot worse because my grandmother wasn't able to pray for us anymore or something. It's just a thought and I can't be sure, but I speculate that that might be the reason. 
So once, I didn't go to the toilet before sleeping one night, and this caused me to wake up at around 2am busting to go to the toilet. When I got back, I wanted to go back to sleep again, but this night I heard two knocks coming from my closet. Like, it was 100% in my room, and it would have sounded muffled and dulled, and I knew this too because I heard my flatmate next room moving in, talking in her room, drying her hair, etc., so I just tried to ignore it and turned around in my bed so I didn't have to face the closet anymore. But then, again, I heard the knocking. This time there was three of them and it was much more aggressive. I stood up at this and opened the closet, but as I expected, there was nothing there. Now, I want to talk about my two friends as well, which know every single detail about what's happened to me. I have contact to these two on a daily basis, but since I started telling them about my experiences, the creepy stuff has started to happen at their place too. So my friend A told me that their house bell just sometimes ringed on the evening when she was around. On one occasion, the ring would stop for like 30 minutes. They got it off, and changed the batteries, plugged it in somewhere else, but they would still hear the ring just randomly. My friend B actually started experiencing stuff as well. His computer would just start in the middle of the night, like my Wii. The ventilation in the bathroom would go on by itself, even though you have to actually switch it on by hand since it's an old house, and the cats would just go crazy every evening. I have to say that I can't guarantee that the story from friend A is true, because I know it sounds a little bit weird. But I can guarantee that I witnessed a few things at B's house when I was around. So anyway, right now I'm moving out of the flat since I finished my apprenticeship this August. I got the keys to my new apartment yesterday and I started packing things up in my room right now. There were a lot of boxes and things stored under my bed. Everything was super dusty. So step by step I got everything out of there and I was at the point where almost everything was out. Except the last few boxes and a scrap of paper. I got the paper and noticed that it was a photograph of a boy. It was very wrinkled and it smelled a bit like smoke. I knew that it smelled like house fire almost instantly because my ex-boyfriend's house actually burned down and they still saved some of their family pictures and they smelled exactly the same way. I noticed the smell immediately on this photo and I started crying and called both friend A and B. Like, I was shaking pretty badly and I felt really unsafe being in my room by myself. Like... Why was all this bullcrap happening to me? I mean, who was this boy in this photo and where did this photo even come from? I investigated the picture further though and it was tattered on all sides. The paper was fully printed on one side and on the other there was a handprint. And it was a really tiny handprint like it was from a child. But along the handprint there were brown burnt parts. Upon seeing this too, I wanted to get it out of my room, but I couldn't throw it away since friend A wanted to see it the next day, which was going to be today. So I went downstairs and I placed it on the kitchen table since I knew that I'll walk past it the next morning to get my lunch and then I would see it and it would remind me. Also, just to note this as well, it couldn't have been from my previous tenant since my room was completely empty when I moved in. A month ago, I completely rearranged the furniture in my room as well and I threw everything away that I didn't need anymore and I cleaned the whole thing up and I can assure you that this picture was not there. So, the rest of the evening felt really unpeaceful as well. I was pretty scared and I had a bad feeling about every room in my house. Just bad vibes everywhere if you catch my drift. I took a shower and I remembered that I still had to close the balcony door because it was going to rain later on. So I went downstairs and shortly before I could reach the floor downstairs, I heard steps and something which sounded like a key ring I guess. You know how when two keys or more come together and they make like a, a jingling noise? My first thought though was that it must have been one of my roommates. From the stairs you couldn't actually look into the kitchen so I didn't know for sure but it sure sounded like them and I was 10,000% sure that somebody was there. Like the sound was in this apartment, it was a few meters away from me and it was like it was in the kitchen. I was sure that it was one of my flatmates that was down there. So I turned around and was about to go to my room again since I didn't feel like talking to somebody at that moment. 
but before I made a step back up, I thought that I should say hi, because if I didn't, I would just have to come back down anyway again and say hi, so, I mean, I could just say hi now and avoid further conversation later. So I turned around again and I went to the kitchen, and it really messed with me when I saw that nobody, absolutely nobody, was down there. The windows were closed, the door was shut, and at this, I ran upstairs immediately and locked myself in my room. The furniture seemed to creak louder and more intense that evening as well. I don't know if that was just adrenaline rushing through me or if there was something going on, but it was strange nonetheless. After my hysteria though, I did manage to fall asleep, surprisingly fast as well. But when I woke up, it honestly felt like I just hadn't slept at all. I think it was because regularly I woke up that night, having sort of mini panic attacks. The kind of thing that happens when you have a bad nightmare about falling and you just kind of are shook awake. But the strange thing is that I didn't really dream at all that night. But I still woke up multiple times with heavy beating hearts and shaking and sweating and just gasping for air. I can recall that this happened a few times that night as well and I can recall after that that I woke up and I walked aimlessly around my room for a few minutes I think. I know that I did that as well but I really can't remember why and at this point I'm actually a little bit afraid of myself. But anyway, like I said, the next morning I woke up with the feeling like I hadn't slept at all. Every bone and muscle was just aching and I barely could open my eyes. When I got ready, I went downstairs to get my lunch, but I remembered the picture, and you probably guessed it, but it just wasn't there anymore. I don't believe that my flatmates took it too, because they always leave things lying around for weeks, letters, food, dishes, and practically everything, so I'm pretty sure that it wasn't them. Plus, they would have asked me about it, I think. But the thing is, is that... I didn't look at the table yesterday when I went into the kitchen and heard the footsteps, so I can't tell if this thing took it or not. Anyway, this whole experience has just been a roller coaster, and I know it's really weird. My grandma is still missing and people are still looking for her, so there's that going on. I'm sorry for just how jumbled all this is and how crazy it sounds. I know, trust me, I know. But I thought that it was worth telling someone about this. I'll be moving out in a week and I don't know if this thing is going to follow me or not. So I would really, really appreciate if somebody would help me. This happened three years ago, right when we were having our house restored. So there was scaffolding just everywhere outside the house, which has two stories. There was a wood panel in front of my window, which overlooks the street, so it wouldn't be damaged by the coating. But all the other panels had been taken off, so my window was the last one that was still protected. It was the weekend, and that night, my parents were having dinner at some friend's house who lived outside of town, and I was alone with my sister and her boyfriend, who slept in the bedroom right above mine. We were all exhausted and went to bed at around 10pm. As usual, as typical 19 year olds do, I still wanted to watch an episode of a TV show but there was a festival a few blocks away with loud music so I decided to put on my headphones. I was about 20 minutes into the episode when I heard some metallic noises outside, like the scaffoldings were shaking. I took off my headphones and listened for a moment. The noises were still there but it was very discreet. Now, I have severe anxiety and I'm pretty used to things feeling a bit off, so I try to rationalize everything, otherwise it's just too overwhelming for me and I go into full panic mode. So I told myself, okay, must be the wind, nothing to worry about. I put my headphones back and I resumed my episode. Barely a minute later though, my sister barged into my room, no need to tell you that I jumped like someone had yelled into my ears. I was super annoyed at first, but... She seemed stressed, so I took my headphones off, and then she whispered that there were three guys right outside your window. Didn't you hear them? I thought it was some kind of a sick joke, but she was deadly serious. I got out of bed and then saw her boyfriend come down too. We stared at each other in silence for a few seconds, and I heard voices. Quiet, hushed voices. 
I was literally frozen with fear, and yes, bravery is really not my strong suit, and I started shaking. My sister immediately took my phone and called the cops because I was too panicked to say anything, and she didn't want her boyfriend to call because she was scared the cops wouldn't come if it was a man who called. She made sure to speak super loud so the men outside would hear and explain that there were three guys who were trying to break into our house via the scaffoldings and that we were two women alone. And guess what the cops said? Yeah, well, can't you just open another window and tell them to go away? Sure. My sister told them that it was out of the question, asked them to come and the cops made it damn clear that they wouldn't because of the festival, even though our house was just a few blocks away from it. Welcome to France. My sister eventually hung up since there was nothing to do to convince them. But then we were kind of desperate. So we resorted to our last option, our dog. She was used to the noises of construction work so she stayed quiet the whole time. We bring her upstairs in my room and she must have felt our anxiety because when she heard the voices this time she started barking like crazy. She's actually a small hunting dog who doesn't like strangers and has a very big voice for her size. And almost as soon as she barked, we heard really loud noises this time, meaning that they were getting back down to the street. We waited a few minutes and then went to the room next to mine and carefully opened the window to see if they were actually gone. They were about 10 meters away just looking at the house and when they saw us looking, they started walking away like nothing had happened. They turned left and then came back, went right and came back again, and finally walked towards the other end of the street, watching other houses. We didn't sleep until my parents came back three hours later, just in case, and while we were waiting for them, my sister told me that when she first heard the noises, she turned around in her bed and saw them at her window. Apparently, they checked the house from the outside, saw my sister and her boyfriend, and still decided to break in. Turns out, too, that the construction workers forgot to take off the ladder that granted access to the scaffoldings. So, if your house or building is being restored, my advice is keep an eye on those ladders and always make sure that they're taken off each night. I work as a caretaker for a school building. Because my building is small, we only have two people. One person works at 6am to 2.48pm, and the second works from 2.42pm to 11pm. Sometimes there are people renting out the gym there, but after 10.30 they're always gone, and last night there was nobody there, so I'd been alone since the daycare left at 6pm. Around 7.30 I had walked around the building's interior and checked that every window was shut, every door was locked, and there were no teachers still working in the building, so I knew I was 100% alone. Around 11, I was finishing up my shift. Our exit is a door in our storage room, and there's an alarm panel right by the door, so we can set the alarm, and the door leads right out to the parking lot. Now, right outside the storage room is a set of double doors that also lead outside. They are typically used by staff, and as I waited for it to hit 11, I heard movement and men's voices outside. I couldn't make out what they were saying, but... I decided I'd listen for them to leave and get on the phone with a friend while I walked out to my car. But suddenly, at the double doors beside the storage room, I heard someone start pulling and pushing at the door, trying to get it open. After a bit of that, I heard, I guess she's not here. But keep in mind, this is a male-dominated field, so if they didn't know who was working, they would have assumed that it was a he. I called my supervisor to check if there was a legitimate reason why someone might be trying to get in, and it wasn't, then stayed on the phone with him until I got to my car safely. Now, there are some security cameras, but only the principal can access them, so the next day we looked at them and it was even creepier than I'd expected. There were two men, late teens, early twenties, and they came in from the car park behind the building walk up the side, directly to the doors, try them, stand there for a second, and then walk back the way that they come. It was really weird, but my gut tells me that they may have been watching me for some time out there. So I grew up in the countryside in Germany, and my parents bought this super beautiful old farm and created their own space there. 
It was really old, over a hundred years, I think. And of course, it had a lot of history. But I was never really terrified, nor felt that there was something paranormal going on there. But one day, I was maybe around seven or eight, I'd say. I was upstairs doing my homework, and I heard the mowing machine in our garden, and figured out that it would be my mum or my brother. But then I heard my mum clearly calling me. At first, I felt that she called my name, but when I thought back about it, I realized that she hadn't. She just yelled upstairs if I was there, and I yelled downstairs that I was, and she told me to come to the kitchen. I thought to myself that lunch must be ready, and I rushed downstairs. I ran around the corner in the hallway, and I really had to do a full stop in full speed, since I almost crashed into this old woman just standing there. She was wearing really simple but nice clothes in white and grey, and had her white hair loosely tied up in a bun. And she looked really shocked. She stared at me as if she had just seen a ghost. Since I almost ran her over, I immediately began to apologise, but in the blink of an eye, she was just gone. She literally just faded away in front of my eyes. That was a little too much for me to take obviously, so I started to scream my lungs out for my mum, but she just didn't answer. I ran into the backyard to look for her and saw her just working with the machine, which means that there was just no chance at all that she could have called me downstairs. I explained everything to her and she tried to make me calm down by saying that I must have had a bad daydream or something, but I was fully awake and I knew what I saw and even what I heard. After that, I was terrified, seriously terrified for almost a year, to walk around corners fast. I would always try to walk extremely loud while doing that, or coughing right before, so for the case that someone was standing on the other side, they would have enough time to just fade away. I never saw this lady again, and hopefully she also didn't experience me another time. I guess that she was even more terrified than I was. This whole experience has made me question dimensions a lot. In her world, I was this creepy young girl rushing down the stairs and then calling for my mummy. And in my world, she was this strange old woman that just came out of nowhere. This happened about four years ago, back when I was a lot younger and desperate for money. It was a Friday and my girlfriend and I wanted to go to the local casino with one of our friends just to have some drinks and lose a bit of cash on the slots. It was a cheaper alternative to going out and drinking since you could just spend $10 and drink for free the whole night as long as you just keep playing the slots. So we got there at around 6pm, my girlfriend and her friend dressed in their best and me just kind of slapped together into something a bit better than just woke up. I was the only male in the group, and while I was quite slender at the time, I also had a full beard and a shaven head, so it would have been pretty difficult to mistake me for a female. We played the slots until about midnight, taking full advantage of the free drinks, and I was the designated driver, so I just drank coke the entire night while my girlfriend and her friend got absolutely wasted. Once the last of the money that we brought with us ran out, we decided to just call it quits and go home. The parking lot is on the further side of the casino and we were parked on the third floor. The casino's parking lot was four stories high and you could either take the stairs on the left or up an elevator on the right. On each floor there was a massive sliding door that led to the parking lot once you got up there. As we made our way towards the stairwell though, some chubby guy in a trench coat stumbled up to me, clearly drunk, and put his arm around my shoulder. I'm quite a friendly person, so I just kind of stood there and waited to see what this person wanted before I just shrugged him off. He had greasy, curly black hair, and I remember his breath just smelled like cigarettes. My girlfriend and her friend just kind of hanged back, silently laughing at me, since this kind of thing happens often to me. But for some reason, drunk people just really like me. He leaned in closer to me and told me that he just won big and couldn't remember where he parked his car. He pulled out a big wad of cash from his pocket and told me that if I could help him find his car, that he'll give me 1k. I was absolutely floored since that was the most cash that I had ever seen in my life. And so, I agreed to it immediately. We walked towards the parking lot together, his arms still around my shoulder and his weight leaned onto me. 
My plan was to search the first floor with his car keys and go up to the next level if we don't find it. He had his arm around me the whole time as we made our way to the entrance of the lot, my girlfriend and her friend going towards the stairs as me and the guy walked towards the entrance to level 1. The whole time he was just talking really loudly to me, his words slurring as he stumbled around the place. But the moment my girlfriend and her friend ducked out of sight, he tightened his grip around my neck, looked me in the eyes and said, 1k for finding my car and anal. He tightened his grip even further and tried to grab my arm, not slurring any of those words. I was stunned for a second as he started pulling me towards the elevator, his hand still trying to grab for my arm. Luckily, I used to do MMA for a few years when I was younger, so I knew how to get out of a grapple and those long hours of training kicked in. I slipped my head out from his arm and pulled myself free before he could tighten his grip further. He frantically tried to grab me again, his fingernails racking across the skin of my arm as I pulled it back from him and took a few steps away. And immediately, he stood up straight and hurriedly walked through the door to level 1, his drunken stumble completely gone as he ducked out of sight. I ran back to my friends in the stairwell who saw the entire thing and were laughing their heads off thinking about how funny the whole situation was. When they saw that he left deep scratches on my arm when I broke free though, they realized just how serious the situation was. It's scary to think that they would have probably just stood there and watched me get taken, thinking that it was just some drunk guy messing with me. So I saw this about four years ago at work and it really creeped me the hell out. I work for a digital surveillance company that runs the eye in the sky for thousands of restaurants, bars, and gas stations across the US. And from time to time, we get calls for investigations to look into robberies and theft, etc. So one day, we get a call from a popular fast food chain located in the heart of Detroit. They say an employee OD'd by the dumpster and they needed us to get some answers on the situation. First, basically, what happened and how long he was there. But the next question is where it starts to get weird. You see, the dumpsters had a, a brick wall around it. It had two entrances to the dumpster, a gate that you had to pass when you walked out the back door, and the big gates where the garbage truck has access to the dumpster to empty it out. They claimed that those big gates were always open, and the small gate by the back door was locked from the inside. Nobody ever used that smaller gate, but... The weird thing was that when the body was found, an employee walked out, and that gate that was never open was indeed open, and the body was sitting there on full display. So the question was, who the hell opened that gate? So we downloaded the footage. Now one night, the employee goes outside, throws out the trash, and you can kind of see him through the locked gate that was never open. It was see-through, but very difficult to actually see though. The way the camera was angled, you could just kind of see over the top also. And he injects himself, slumps over, and keels over dead behind the dumpster. He was out there for two and a half days. No employees ever come to look for him. It's pouring rain both days, and for two days, employees come and go taking out the trash and not seeing him. But then, on the third day in the morning sunshine, clear as day, the gate just slowly opens by itself. Nobody comes, nobody goes. The gate just opens by itself and the body is there in the same position it was two and a half days earlier. I literally felt chills down my spine when I saw this too and to this day I just simply cannot explain it without thinking that it was actually paranormal. Anyway, a couple of hours later, an employee walks out with a trash bag, sees the body, freaks out, and calls the cops. I didn't write it, but we basically had to write a report on how a gate apparently just opened itself. So this all started at a convention and is technically still ongoing. My boyfriend, Damien, was dressed as a character from a game that isn't too well known, so we both assumed that no one would recognize him. But lo and behold, about halfway through the second day, we hear someone call and say the character's name, 
and we see someone dressed as another person from that game come bounding towards us with a friend in tow. And they introduce themselves, and I'll call the cosplay Arena and their friend Hilda, and we all started chatting. We became fast friends, and we spent the rest of the con just hanging out. When it came time to leave, we exchanged Discord info and would continue to talk to each other daily. Damien and I, as well as Rena, all decided to head to another con together near the end of October. As the days progressed, Rena became infatuated with both Damien and I. Mostly Damien, but I don't think that they would have admitted that. Another of us acknowledged the warning signs, and they became comfortable with us after only knowing us for a week. But they would constantly tell us that they loved us, despite not really knowing us. Whenever we would hang out, they would act as if we were dating as well. They would also cling to Damien's arm in public, and give evil eyes to anyone who got even close. They called themselves obsessive, telling us that all of their previous relationships had failed for a good reason, and insisting that we would learn to hate them eventually. We ignored all of this, and I tried to convince them that they were hurting themselves with negative thoughts and that they were worthy of love. I believe my first mistake was telling them that I actually loved them, I'm going to tell you that I love you if I think you're a good person, but that's just something that I do, but they really took it to heart and not in a good way. We enabled them, consoling them every single line that we spoke because they always had something negative to say about themselves. Call me naive, but I want everyone to be happy and to get along and to love themselves. So when I see someone beating themselves up, I feel like I have to help them. Almost every other thing that Rena said was self-deprecating as well, and they explained to us that they were raised to think that they were useless and unlovable. They poured their heart out to us despite us barely knowing each other, and I respected that. I don't want to say that I pitied them, but I will admit that I felt bad and I desperately wanted to help them to better themselves and to learn to be happy again. But no matter what I said or did for them, nothing ever really changed. The real red flag started popping up at the convention this month though, but we just got back from it today and boy, was it a wild ride. We didn't get to do anything that we had originally planned. Rena was fixated on the idea that they had come with us to this convention simply in order to have sex with Damien. They didn't even care about the con itself, they just wanted to be with us as often as possible, and they wanted to get intimate with a man they hardly knew anything about. Damien ended up having to fake being in a bad mood every time that they brought it up, just to get them to drop it. It upset me greatly to see him like that, and because I have a tendency to take others' emotions onto myself, I had an awful time at the con that I normally would have enjoyed. He didn't get the chance to tell me that he was faking it, because every time he tried to tell me or message me about it, the arena was getting all up in his space. They gave us presents while we were there, though. I got a lovely necklace, which I now wear with my other ones, and Damien got a bottle full of little pill capsules, each adorned with a different smiley face and each containing a unique love letter. Rena had insisted that he open at least one of them while we were there at the convention, but he told them that he didn't want to. And in the hotel bed that night, Rena told us that they were going to kill themselves so that they wouldn't have to leave us, among other things. I can barely recall the conversation as I was so freaked out by what they were saying, but they were behaving in a really threatening and manipulative manner. But we had to bring Rena to Hilda's house after the con, and Damien's car stalled and got flooded because of a bad storm. And Rena's response to this was to have a complete breakdown and scream and cry about how they ruin every life that they walk into, and how they were awful people and that they should just end themselves. We were stranded there for over three hours, and not once did they stop. It was the most uncomfortable thing that I've been in for a very long time. Now, initially when we had got home, he decided that he would just throw the love letter bottle away, and my curiosity got the better of me though, and I convinced him to open it. Some of them were really sweet, like, I love your cute nose, and I love your soft warm hugs, but then others were really unsettling. I love that each passing day is another day closer to you. I love making you need me as much as I need you. I love when you tell me that you love me, but I want you to need me. And the real kicker? 
I love knowing that you couldn't leave me if you tried. That was the last straw for both of us. It's been building up since we'd met Rena for the first time, and it's definitely escalating in a dangerous direction now. I've really come to hate the nicknames that they give me, and uh, we want to let them down easy so as to not provoke them, because, to be honest, at this point, they really scare me. They know where Damien lives, and they're going to be moving out here next year. All we can really do at this point is pray that they don't do anything rash. So this, uh, this happened really recently. I've called and reported it to the police, and I'm home safely, but I guess that I'm still in shock. So I finished work early today and decided to go out for a run. I set out around 4.30 and decided my usual route, which crosses many roads, will not be very practical and so I took an alternate route along a canal towpath and some pathways through woods that I knew would be less busy. Everything was going well. I was pushing myself steady until I got to a pathway on the way back around 6Ks out into the route. It's a long straight path with a canal on the left side. And on the right there is a wasteland where some factories used to be or something, but have mostly been demolished. It's been left abandoned for as long as I can remember, and is overgrown with trees and weeds, but there are the odd bits of an old factory that for some reason just weren't fully demolished. As I got level with one part of the factory, which still had some old metal fire escape steps attached to it, I noticed a rough looking guy sat on the wall with his legs hanging down. He jumped to his feet as he saw me coming and shouted something, but I couldn't make it out. As I came level to where he was, I heard him say, Wait there, can you help me find my phone? He said this while he was running down the steps, and so I stopped as I got level with where the bottom of the steps were, meaning that we were standing just a few feet apart, but with a fence in between us. It was a really old iron fence with vertical metal bars that have spikes at the top like you sometimes see around churches and things. He asked me if I could help him with finding his phone again, saying that he had dropped it somewhere nearby and asked if I could ring his number so that he could listen for it. I felt like I couldn't exactly refuse as my phone was strapped to my arm, so I said he could tell me the number and I took my phone off my arm and unlocked it. He blurted out some phone number but said it far too fast and it didn't begin with 07 which made me start to feel like just something wasn't right. And although I was beginning to suspect at this point I wasn't too worried. I'm in pretty good shape and I had a big size and weight advantage over him plus there was a fence between us. He didn't seem in very good physical shape and seemed like he might be homeless or something. I figured that if he was trying to mug me for my phone that his only chance would be if he pulled a knife on me so I made sure to stay a good distance away from the fence and kept my eyes on where his hands were. So I told him that I didn't catch any of the numbers because he said it too quickly and he came out with another number this time and it did have an 07 at the beginning. I entered seven numbers and then he started to look around and said I can hear it come and help me look. He said this as he looked around the ground, and I was about to say that I hadn't even finished dialing when a much larger black guy appeared from behind a section of the wall to my right. He was also really scruffy looking, and from the look of his eyes, it seemed like he was on drugs. He came out saying that he could hear the phone ringing over towards him and beckoned me to come through a gap in the fence and help look. The white guy then said, It is ringing, yeah? And I told him that it was, even though I still hadn't dialed the last digits and now I was sure that they were trying to lure me to come over to that side of the fence. After two or three minutes of them beckoning me to come and help them, always insisting that they could hear the ring, I heard the black guy say he's not going to fall for it. He said it in a hushed way as if he thought that I wouldn't hear but with it being out in the middle of nowhere, I could clearly understand what this guy was saying. The white guy then started acting quite aggressive and punched a tree telling me that he needed the phone badly and how his whole life was on that phone telling me to come and help him look for it. While he was punching the tree and ranting, the black guy had taken a few steps away to the right, meaning that I couldn't keep my eyes on both of them at the same time. 
It was after 5pm by this point and had gotten dark all of a sudden, which made the whole thing just that much more unsettling. I noticed that there was a gap in the fence where some of the bars had been removed, right where the black guy was heading, and I decided at that point to just get the hell out of there, and I made a run for it. Neither of them said anything as I ran away, which makes me sure that they had malicious intentions. I mean, if they had genuinely lost their phone and needed help, I would expect them to shout, where are you going, or something to try and get me to come back, but they didn't shout anything. After sprinting for a good 20 to 30 seconds, I turned to see if they were chasing me, and they were both stood on the path around where the gap in the fence had been, but they just weren't chasing me. They were just standing there and just watching me run away. I continued running away, but kept looking back every few seconds until I was out of sight. It was at this stage that I got off the canal path and back onto the roads. The person that I spoke to on the phone to report it took my details and the descriptions but seemed to think that it wasn't anything worth worrying about but said that it will be investigated. The whole incident has left me a bit unnerved I'll admit and I'm pretty sure that I won't be jogging that route any time again, alone anyway. Late June, me, 19 female, and my boyfriend, 19 male, we were headed back from a Walmart in this town. We live about an hour apart and I was visiting. I was driving on somewhat of a back road and there was a four-way stop. Across from me was what looked like a work truck parked behind another car and flashing its brights. Nobody else was at the intersection so I decided to go ahead and just keep on driving. And as soon as I pulled out, a car came speeding somewhere around 90 miles per hour in a 30 mile per hour zone from around a corner and almost T-boned my car on the passenger side. Luckily, I sped up and got away and the car swerved and stopped on the side of the road and flashed its hazards. We were obviously pretty freaked out. Maybe it wasn't the right thing to do as well, but I just kept driving because, well, nobody was hurt and probably just shaken up a bit. So we just kept driving and my boyfriend was guiding me through the roads and we were talking about how bizarre it was that we didn't even see or hear the other car. But then I noticed that there's a car behind us. It's probably a, a good thousand feet behind us so I don't think anything about it. But then it just keeps getting closer and closer. Finally this car is right on my ass and once he's on my ass he turns on an extremely bright light and it nearly blinds me. We realized that it's the work truck that was across the intersection. I ducked down out of the way of my rear view so I could see the road and keep driving, even speeding up a little. My boyfriend tells me maybe we should pull over, maybe somebody was hurt and they're flagging us down. But we were on a back road with absolutely no light posts and nowhere to pull in that was well lit, so I said absolutely not. Eventually, my boyfriend had to hold the wheel for me because I couldn't see at all. My vision was blurry and spotty. I started to pull into a neighborhood, but the truck started passing me and we almost got into another accident. The neighborhood was dark, of course, and the truck slows down to a stop and backs up so that it's directly behind us, still on the main road while we're parked in this neighborhood. The driver starts shining a flashlight at my car, mostly at me, and then goes over to my boyfriend... After it gets to him, the light shuts off and the truck just slowly pulls off and leaves. My boyfriend and I were shaken up and once I regained my vision, I drove us back to his apartment, wary of the cars around us. We told his dad about it and he said that it's a good thing that we didn't get out of the car because people get murdered all the time from this stuff. But we thought that it was just weird, but thinking back on it... The driver probably saw me and targeted me and once they realized that there were two people in the car, they didn't want to deal with that and so they must have left. Which means that they wanted me. At least it seems like that. What do you guys all think? I have had several creepy encounters in my lifetime that I couldn't explain. However, this one happened tonight and it just truly boggles my mind. So I was in a grocery store, desperately trying to find the restroom, 
It was about 10.30 at night and the store closed 30 minutes after. I finally found it and I always walk through the restroom at night to make sure that I'm aware of my surroundings. I checked the stores and all of them were wide open and to my luck the bathroom was completely empty. So I thought. I sit down in my store closet to the sinks and the door and I start doing my thing when all of a sudden from the store next to me to my right I hear a woman say excuse me do you have the time? Her voice was very calm and almost sad I think. Keep in mind though that there was no one in this restroom when I checked it and it was dead silent in there, no pun intended. So I just ignored it and continued peeing. And then as I was finishing I heard tapping on the wall and again heard the voice say excuse me. I was trying to use the bathroom and then leave but after hearing a voice I just couldn't ignore that it happened. I did end up ignoring it and pretended like I had headphones in and I rushed to pull my pants up and just get the hell out of there. It was late at night and there was hardly any people in the store so to hear someone at night next to you when you checked every stall which was all completely empty was scary to say the least. I thought that it could have been a really sketchy situation too like maybe somebody was hiding in there or something and waiting for me to get me or something. As I leave my stall, I hear her say once again, do you have the time? I decided to answer her and I told her that it was 10.30. She replied by saying thank you. And she just sounded so sad and her voice was very monotone. I still didn't understand how someone could have entered the bathroom without me noticing or hearing considering how silent it was in there and I was alone when I entered. Yet somehow... There was a woman right next to me in the empty stall without making a single noise prior to talking to me. Just because I was so confused, I decided that I would peek down a little bit to see if I could see her feet. When I did, there was nothing there. No feet and nothing slightly above that either. The stall was also slightly ajar and wasn't latched closed. And other than her question for the time, I heard absolutely nothing. It was truly dead silent. I proceeded to wash my hands and after that I just left quickly. Even if that was someone tweaked out, I really didn't want to stick around and find out. Because ghost or not, that honestly scared the hell out of me. I never expected this to happen to me specifically because... For some naive reason, I believe that I just couldn't be targeted. The same goes for me thinking that my family couldn't be targeted for any malicious reason too. So, the story begins with my mum, my little brother, 6 years old at the time, and myself being 19. Our washing machine broke at our house and my mum refused to fix it because all of us were always running up the bills anyways when we used the machine constantly. So naturally, we started going to the laundromat to wash all of our clothes instead. Now, the laundromat that we've been using has been the same one that we've used for nearly a decade. I have a big family consisting of eight people, all boys except for my mum, bless her soul. So we usually went to the laundromat for washing clothes, even when the machine was working. Even when we moved houses, we still used the same laundromat because of loyalty reasons. The owners knew us and watched us grow up and were really friendly with us when changes were happening around the laundromat. Now, I recently got some new earbuds that I was itching to test out for my phone, and the laundromat is the perfect place to be able to play some music quietly and wash and dry and fold clothes without causing any issues. The routine started off as normal with my mum and I putting clothes in separate washers, depending on the colour, size and thickness. My little brother, who was with us at the time, was just spinning around playing with any of the other kids that may have been there. We were there in the middle of the day when most people were at work, so it was nearly empty, save for a few independent mums and I think one kid. Putting the clothes into the machines, which were a few garbage bags full, only took us about 15 to 20 minutes. I remember seeing my little brother running up and down the aisles, having got this really bouncy ball from a dispenser that the laundromat had. But during this, both my mum and I noticed that a silver car had pulled up the front of the laundromat and had been sitting there for a long duration whilst no one got out to prepare to wash clothes. Nothing super unusual, but just a little bit odd. 
Even I've been known to sit in the car for half an hour just dreading washing clothes, so I didn't think too much of it. At the time, the clothes had been in the washers and started, so we just all kind of sat around and waited for the clothes to finish washing so we could put them in the dryers and head home after folding. So far, so good. I decided to put my earbuds in, listening to my favourite 200 plus song list that I still haven't sorted. But when I listen to music, I tend to walk around and not pay attention to much, either inside or outside. Though, I always stayed on the front sidewalk right in front of the doors of the laundromat when I did go outside. So I headed outside with my little brother and my mum was still inside and I was pacing while slightly dancing to some music that I was listening to, not really caring what others thought about me and I only stopped when I heard a car honk near my left, making me startle pretty badly and stare at the car that scared me. And it was the silver car that had been parked there earlier. Still, no one had gotten out of the car at this point. I looked over at the car, taking out one of my earbuds and trying to see who honked their horn because it was right near me. The driver's side tinted window rolled down on the car and an older man was sitting in the seat looking directly at me. I instantly got a bad vibe from this guy because he looked like he was just too happy to see me for a complete stranger. My mum had walked outside to our car which was about two cars away from this silver one she was getting something out but didn't notice that I was being talked to by this stranger. And here is how the conversation went. Excuse me young man, I'm a pastor over at the church here. I'm looking for some new musicians for our band because our other ones left. Me, hearing that he was a pastor, immediately put down my guard as I had been to church before and that position is almost always a respected one. Oh, uh, well, I'm not really a musician, but I do know of someone that you can contact. He seemed satisfied with that answer, but he motioned for me to come closer, and I took a step towards the edge of the sidewalk, still not stepping off because I didn't want to get too close. Uh, sorry, can you come closer? I can't quite hear you. Me, just speaking louder, says, I said that I know of someone that you can contact. His name is Steve. He's actually a pianist and a saxophone player. I actually did know this guy because it was one of my best friend's fiancés who was super talented with music and acting. The pastor just motioned me over to him again, but this time his facial expression was less approachable, not menacing, almost annoyed that I hadn't walked up to him yet. By now, my mum had looked up from her car, having gotten whatever she was looking for, and walked up the sidewalk talking to me. Who's that? What do they want? Uh, I don't know. They said that they're a pastor for a church here or something and that they're looking for musicians. Immediately, my mum's expression turned serious and annoyed, saying to back away from the car and to tell him to go find someplace else to look for that. I looked back at the pastor who was then glaring daggers at my mum, like legit scowling at her as if something he had planned had been ruined. I backed away from the sidewalk, glad that I hadn't stepped into the parking lot yet, and just shrugged my shoulders apologetically towards the silver car before turning around and walking back inside the laundromat. My mum followed me inside and asked me more about it later. She said that she had heard the car honk and that she saw the old guy talking to me, but the moment that it looked as if I was going to step into the parking lot, she intervened to stop me because the guy was super suspicious. I argued that I could take care of myself being 19, but she didn't care. Also, we had my little brother still inside the laundromat, so it could have been a ploy to get me distracted in order to get to him, which is even scarier. The only doors to enter, too, were the ones that were directly in front of the laundromat, but our washers and dryers were in the far back corner. But we continued to talk about it, laughing later about how weird it was that a pastor would come to a laundromat to ask for musicians for his church. Why didn't he just go to people in his church to ask for references? It only made it creepier that while we were folding up the clothes after we dried them, we had noticed that the car was gone and the pastor never got out of his car to wash any clothes after sitting in that parking lot for well over an hour. I honestly don't think that he would have been able to pull me through the car window or something because I'm a pretty tall dude, but I figured that maybe they just weren't after me but actually after my little brother who was running around the laundromat the entire time. The place had an entire front wall of windows, so you could see clearly into the place, all the way into the back. Maybe that's the creepiest thing about it all. 
if this guy was trying to get one of us, it was pretty brazen. Oh, and uh, by the way, I went and looked up the church to see if the pastor was telling the truth, but I was pretty shocked to find out that the pastor's picture that was online was nowhere near the same as the one that had approached us that day. It still gives me shivers. I was one of those kids that you would see walking around zoos or amusement parks always wearing a leech. Those were already a thing 20 plus years ago but less common and were initially only tied around the wrist. In my case I'll admit that it was a necessity. I would always start wandering off from the rest of the family no matter what the situation. And this is one of the stories that led me to earning my leash. So it happened when I was about six years old and I went to the zoo with my mum and sisters. Before every family outing, my mum made sure to give me the talk about not walking off again or face the consequences. My mum was a pretty strict parent that made good on her promises too. She had to, being a single mother of three. I didn't try to disobey her per se, but I often just didn't pay attention to the world and people around me. No different this day, I suppose, because I behaved and followed the group for a while, but then a butterfly garden caught my attention, and off I was. When I finally realized that I separated myself from my mum and sisters again, I panicked and I started walking around the zoo looking for them. I was afraid of my mum's reaction more than anything else. After a while, I somehow got it in my head that if I could just walk out, find our car and wait there, my family would eventually find me. And so, I did. I got lost within a couple of minutes, walking around a strange neighborhood looking for either our car or the way back to the zoo. But nothing looked familiar, and I started crying, and my mum was going to be so mad. Then, this man came up to me, just normal looking, about 40 years old, asking me if I'm lost. I explained that I lost my family when I was visiting the zoo, and I'm looking for the way back. I couldn't believe my luck when this man told me that he had just come from the zoo and saw a family there standing near the entrance who were waiting for a little girl with blonde hair and a baseball cap. But it was still a few blocks away so he proposed that I walked with him to his car and then we could drive the rest of the way back. And just the mention of his car finally made me a little hesitant. I told him that I wasn't allowed to get in a car with strangers. My mum would be so mad. He then said something like, that was true, but I look smart enough to know that I could trust someone. I don't remember the exact words, but it was something like that. Also, he added that he spoke to my parents earlier when they were looking for me, so he's not a complete stranger. That just didn't seem right to me though, and I asked him if he really talked to my dad, who had died a year before. And when he said that he did, I broke down crying just uncontrollably. I still didn't understand the situation that I was in. I was just really confused about everything and scared of how angry my mum was going to be after all of this. Finally, my crying caught the attention of the security guard of a parking building lot where we were standing next to, asking if there was something that he could help me with. The guy stepped aside with the security guard and started explaining the situation, but made it vaguely sound like he was my father and we were looking for his wife. The security guard seemed to believe him, pointing us in the right direction towards the zoo. The man thanks the security guard and proceeds to take my hand and walk away. The security guard takes a look at me and asks me in a comforting and friendly adult to child kind of way why I'm still crying. I tell him that my dad is dead. He looks really confused for a few seconds and then asks if this man is not my dad. I tell him again, no, my dad is dead. And in a split second... His whole face and posture changes and he turns to look at this guy who's trying to explain that he never actually said that he was my dad, that the security guard must have misunderstood and that he was just helping me find my mom. The security guard said that he appreciated the man's help but he would take me off his hands now and the guy immediately just took off. I don't think that there was much else the security guard could have done to be honest. But in the end, I explained the whole situation and after making a phone call, he walked me to the entrance of the zoo, which was just around the corner from the parking building by the way. From there, we were brought to the security guard's office where my mum and sisters were already waiting. I feel extremely lucky for the security guard being at the right place at the right time that day. 
and very grateful for the extra second of time that he took to understand what was going on. That obviously made all the difference. I live in a small town in Denmark with a population of roughly 3,000 people where nothing really ever happens and the following scared the entire town half to death. So back in 2005 or so when I was still in kindergarten, a strange and agitated man who was a father to one of the children came and demanded my teacher that he wanted to see his daughter and take her out of school. My teacher could see in his eyes that something just wasn't right and that he was extremely upset. He therefore denied him to see his daughter and after a very uncomfortable discussion, the father eventually gave up, walked to his car without looking back and drove home. My teacher grew very worried and decided to call the local police to go out and check the family's house and later that day, it came on the news that the father had murdered his own wife with a gun and afterwards shot himself too. At the time, my best friend lived next door to the family and he has since told me that he could hear the mother screaming in a very horrifying way, followed by three gunshots, a grown man crying his heart out, ten seconds of silence and then finally one more shot. It really creeps me out just thinking about this and I feel really sorry for the daughter who was left an orphan at such an early stage in life. I really do not know what would have happened to the daughter if my teacher had not stopped the man from taking her home with him that day. And I hope that she's having a decent life, wherever she is. So I went on a ghost tour in New Orleans about two years ago. We went to some fairly non-active, unimpressive places first, and last, almost as a, an afterthought it seems, we ended up at this museum on Rampart Street. It was a voodoo museum that the tour company operated out of, and it was a total tourist trap. There were four of us, two couples, and the tour guide showed us there was a, a door behind a, a body bag that was hanging on the wall or something. She explained that behind the door was our last location to investigate for the evening and we'd go in twos as we'd done before. My partner and I had gone first at the other big location so we let the couple with us go into this place first. The tour guide took us into another room and showed us to a room with some chairs and a night vision monitor with our friends on it. They looked to be in a tiny apartment and we could hear that they were above us. After not long at all, maybe three minutes I'd guess, they both came back into the room looking shaken. They both said that we don't know what's going on in there, but no bueno, we had to get out. But these were not people who were easily rattled as well, I should add. Curious now, my partner and I went next. There were a few lights of stairs that led into a small apartment. There was a main room with a door off it to the left that led to a small bedroom. To the right was a door leading to a, a galley kitchen, I'd guess, a, a narrow hallway and a bathroom at the end. We walked around in the living room and the bedroom and there were some small dolls in the bedroom. And then we heard what we thought would have been a, a small child giggling at one point. Nothing big and scary, but at that point, it began to become a little bit unsettling. But the second we walked across the threshold into the kitchen, everything changed. It was small and cramped with a, a dirty stove and an empty dirty fridge with the doors hanging open. Nothing remarkable. But it was how it just felt. The only way I can describe it is uh, I just instantly had the feeling in my stomach that you get on roller coasters but not in a good way. My mouth went dry and there was something else that seemed to be in the building. I tried to shake it off and walk down the narrow hallway to the bathroom. Again, standard bathroom, sink, mirror, but... That feeling just wouldn't go away, and the second feeling crept up even more until I finally pinpointed it. I felt like there was just an incredibly angry and evil, malevolent something that hated me to the core of my being, just staring me down from a quarter of an inch from my face, but it was invisible. This thing just hated me like nothing could possibly hate anything on this earth, and it had just met me. There was not a shred of doubt in my mind that this thing was not human. I don't remember if I told my partner that I wanted to leave or if I ran out on my own. I honestly don't remember coming down the stairs back to the museum too. I just remember being in a chair hyperventilating, chilled to the bone with fear. 
The tour guide looked affected too and I said, what the heck is in that kitchen? Almost sobbing. She said, kind of blandly, he doesn't like me much either. And then she told us. This was apparently what's known as the Rampart Street Murder House. A couple who met during Hurricane Katrina lived up there and their names were Zach and Addie. They were well-known bartenders from the French Quarter. They fought occasionally, but nothing too serious, it seemed. But one night, just out of nowhere, Zach strangled Addie to death and then dismembered her corpse in the bathtub. He cooked her on the stove and then stored the rest of her in the refrigerator, including her head. Then he wrote a note, partied for the weekend, and capped it off by jumping off of the roof of the Omni Hotel. Oh, and by the way, all of the appliances, they were the originals. When my girlfriend was 17 and I was 18, she lived out in the country with her parents and when it snowed badly, she would have to park about a quarter mile away in her grandfather's driveway as her two-wheel drive Pontiac couldn't make it through the hill on her own driveway. But one night in early February, after a, a particularly nasty snowstorm, she was driving home and noticed a, an odd light in the sky. She didn't think much of it and kept on driving and eventually she arrived at her grandfather's. And this is when it got really weird. So I look down at my phone and I see that I've missed about seven consecutive calls from her. I call her back and she answered immediately in a state of panic. She was talking about how she saw a light in the sky and even though she was now parked and her keys were out of the ignition, her dash lights and headlights and radio were going totally haywire and over the radio was nothing but white noise. I could hear the radio over the phone too. I, of course, told her that it was nothing to be worried about, probably just a battery issue, when she just got really quiet. And then she said that she saw a figure at the end of the driveway, and I again wrote it off and said it's probably just the mailbox. And that was when she screamed. The figure had moved seemingly in the blink of an eye from the end of a 60 foot or so long driveway to about 30 feet away. She screamed again when she noticed now that it was slowly moving towards the driver door. It got about 10 feet away from the driver's door and then there was a flash of light and it just vanished. I asked her to describe the figure and she said that it was roughly 7 feet tall, skinnier than, em skinnier than any human should be with long arms that hung down to its knees. She described the head as being almond shaped and was for some reason adamant that it was almond and not elliptical. She got out of her car and made a break for her house, running through snow and ice while on the phone with me, and she screams again. She eventually made it to a house that ran to her room, and she said that when she was running, there was a, a massive flash of light behind her, and that there was a searing pain in her calf. Obviously very freaked out, we spoke on the phone for a while, and eventually she calmed down and she went to bed. The next day, I messaged her in the morning and said something along the lines of, LOL, so did you make it through the night without being abducted? And she responded with something along the lines of, yeah, question mark, what do you mean? And I told her what happened. And she didn't believe me at all. She had and still has no recollection of the night's events. Every record, phone calls and texts of our conversations the night before were gone from her phone and... She only believed me when I screenshotted our conversation on my phone from after she hung up and sent it to her, and showed her all of the phone call records still on my phone. I remember what she told me about the burning sensation in her calf and told her to check it, and lo and behold, there's a really nasty red mark on it. So, what do you guys think? Could this have been some sort of alien experience? And if it wasn't, what the heck else could it have been? G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here. I hope you guys enjoyed the video and if you would like to help me out, then please go ahead and watch another video by clicking on a card on the screen. As always guys, thanks for all the love and support and I'll see you mates in the next one.